I think the theme that continues from last year into this year is one of uncertainty. What's emerged is the link between rate hikes and a slower economy. You throw on that now, this banking crisis or the banking turmoil that we've had, and now you're talking about another layer of risk to economic growth. I don't really think the consumer is about to fall off the cliff here. We expect a slowdown, pretty substantial slowdown, but we are not expecting an outright contraction. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. What a decade last quarter was. What a year the last few days have been. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Boy, Good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Equity futures right now down about a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. TK, the data so far this week week going into payrolls on Friday. Yeah, we featured it yesterday, John, the idea of Atlanta GDP now from an over 3% number. Everybody was sort of comfortable, and the comfort has disappeared in 48 hours. We can look at anything you want. Can you believe a 10-year real yield breaking down through res a support? Can you believe a 10-year real yield under 1%? We're not there yet, but that's indicative of the growth slowdown. Well, let's take the nominal yield at the front end of the curve on a <clears throat> two-year, yeah. shifting lower. Lisa, through the week so far, off the back of that week of unexpected data. The interesting thing to me is, yes, you're seeing the yield space very much retrace back to the lows that we saw during the peak of some of the banking concerns, but stocks are not responding with a lift. Typically, you get a lift when you think that the Fed is going to be cutting rates or if you think that there's going to be softer economic da data. I, not this time. Now we're getting stronger uh, stock for with, performance. With McKee, with Mester today, with Bullard, with uh, Susan Collins of Boston, who's talking about cutting rates? I don't hear one single Fed official framing that idea. And a lot of people in the market it. disagree with them. Yeah. So Loretta Mester, the Cleveland Fed president, who we'll catch up with a little bit later, is looking for 5% Lisa and then stay there through year end. Ultimately, a lot of people in this market don't think they get there. To your point, though, and I think it's a really important one, for much of the year on and off, start of the year and the last couple of weeks, we've been pricing in cuts and that's just good stuff. I think now you start to appreciate the why we might be pricing in rate cuts, and that's why we've got an equity market that's a bit softer off the back of a treasury market that's rallied. I love the way you describe it. It's the good stuff that really can fuel this market on more sort of easy money uh, morphine. This is the w question, right? Are we reaching the point that everyone's been waiting for, the, Mike's, uh, the Mike Wilsons of the world saying that softer economic data will bleed into lower earnings? Are we starting to see that shift? Too soon to say. That said, I think that one big question is the Fed credibility, because as you say, Loretta Master, talking 5%, holding it, and the market saying, we just think you're wrong, and we're going to sure. continue with our conviction. Not all rate cuts are created equally. I think we've said that a few times on this program over the last 12 months or so. It's not just about whether you get rate cuts. It's why you might get rate cuts, Tom. And based on the data so far this week, I think that's five consecutive months that we've had the ISM sub-50 oh. in contraction territory. Yeah, you weren't here, and I, I featured it, John. The way you look at the ISM is really the first clarion call of the month. I have to admit there has been adjustment here here to a growth slowdown. But where I haven't seen it is the confusion of the U.S. dollar. I know we're going to lead off with that in this hour, but I need some signals from the currency market, and I'm really not getting them yet in Technicolor. Is this a politics-free zone this morning? Are we doing that? I think, John. I no think, way. You know, I, wish talk about I wish it were. I wish it was. I wish it were. But I think that the problem is this is dominating a lot of the news, and it raises some policy questions. I mean, it does. Mm. Not necessarily uh, this. Not well, I do I think that there's a question about the election next year, the Republican leadership. Yes. I think that there's a question about what can get done as the sort of fissure continues to widen in D.C. These are some of the policy questions. I thought, you know, John, John wasn't here. We do, and frankly, John, a British voice here would have been would have been really, really welcome. But and I think Leslie Vinger Murray was great yesterday and Richard Haas. We need to cover it, but we need to cover it within, as Ambassador Haas said, the confidence of the nation away from what I witnessed yesterday in the cable TV. Derby. We don't want to do that. Oh, if you want to cover it, let's get a meter analyst on. Wow. Yeah. Cable news absolutely lapping it up. I mean, absolutely ridiculous. What would British no, media seriously, do? Absolutely I mean, ridiculous. Yes, yeah. The, the hype train <clears throat> straight back to the pre-2022 play. No, no, this started, I mean, John, like, John, no. This, come on, they're John, loving it. Gift to ratings. This started with, I, I'm going to get in trouble here, but I think it's true. This started with a white Bronco. This started with a helicopter, OJ. a white Bronco in Los Angeles years ago, which, you know, I remember, as many of us do, Even the all former president that. ideas, Tom, maybe they want... take the white Bronco next time from Trump <laughs> well, Tower down. We're, we're going to stick 
<laughs> down to Fida. Folks, our <laughs> team has done a great yeah. job on this. We're oh, going to stick Lord, with please. people like Leslie Vinger Murray and Richard Haas to drive us forward. Greg Vallier doing a great job. Looking that forward to well. that. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie a little bit later <laughs> in the next couple of hours as well. Equity futures right now on the S&P 500, down two-tenths of 1% on the S&P. And the bond market yields look like this on a two-year higher after dropping away in the last couple of sessions. Your two-year at the moment is 388. Your 10-year, 335. Let's call it 336. Up about two basis points on a session. And euro dollar Lisa just below 110, 109.52. All right, so we get round two with Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester with our very own Michael McKee at 8.30 a.m. And you did mention this, John, that yesterday uh, at an event at NYU, she talked about keeping the Fed funds rate above 5% for a prolonged period of time to fight inflation. Let's see her reiterate some of those comments and see whether the uh, two-year yield takes any notice from that, because so far they are not. And I find this really interesting, the Fed credibility gap that continues in markets. Today we also get a slew of economic data uh, in particular. And before we get that, French President Emmanuel Macron is traveling to China along with EU Commissioner uh, President uh, Ursula von der Leyen. Very curious to see this paired in direct conflict with Kevin McCarthy, House Speaker, speaking with uh, Taiwan's uh, President Tsai. This question of is there a fissure between the U.S. and Europe when it comes to negotiations with China? And does this fissure kind of come on the heels of perhaps a divergence in economic dependency? And that really speaks to the economic data that we're getting today, including the 80 employment data at 815 that everyone's going to shrug off and say doesn't matter. ISM services data for March at 10 a.m. That does matter, especially after the big disappointment that we saw in manufacturing. But, John, do we get a repeat of what we saw yesterday with that jolts data coming in surprisingly at the lowest rate, below 10 million job openings for the first time going back to 2021? The response in markets of stocks going down was so interesting to me, especially because it implies that perhaps we're winning the fight in terms of tightening, uh, it's in terms of loosening a very tight labour market. Hey, Lisa, thanks for that. Just a sprinkle of data through today going into payrolls on Friday. Joining us now is George Saravelos, the global head of FX research at Deutsche Bank. Hey, George, great to catch up and good to see you, as always. European exceptionalism, George, is not something we often talk about in a good way. You are. Why? Good morning, John. Uh, so I think this um, discussion around the labor market, uh, which Lisa mentioned before, is absolutely critical in establishing uh, that divergence. And if you look at the U.S., wages have been moving down now pretty consistently for the last uh, few months. Um, some of the underlying key indicators we've identified, such as the quit rate, um, has been coming down. And in contrast, if you look at what's going on in Europe, wages are accelerating. The latest data batch we had doesn't get much publicity, but it was up at 5%. So you're now in a situation where the European labor market is actually tighter um, than the U.S. And the last mm. time that happened, ECB rates were above the Fed. And I don't think that's something that's yet fully uh, accommodated in market pricing, so to speak. But it's obviously very, very relevant. George, the dynamics right now are extraordinary. I went back and forth with Mohammed El Arian this morning on New Zealand with a 50 bait beep lift. It was a 3.1 standard deviation jump, strong New Zealand dollar uh, versus the Australian dollar. It seems like there's dynamics out there beginning to happen. The cliche is race to the bottom. What does a new race look like when we look at uh, nations that are forced to raise interest rates? So I think the market is very um, embedded, so to speak, with this dollar smile framework, where if the economy is slowing, the dollar has to do well, because generally it tends to do well in risk aversion. But this is an extremely unusual cycle, um, where if you think about last year, you had dollar exceptionalism in that um, all the countries outside of the U.S. suffered from the energy shock, the China shutdown, and these are now reversing. And I think precisely because of that reason, we're now seeing um, reverse divergence, so to speak. And we're in a position where um, the Fed will be first in the eventual easing cycle. We don't know when, uh, but we have relatively high confidence that that's the case because there's a few things happening in the U.S. that are quite different to the rest of the world. Uh, I mentioned the labor market, which has started to ease, and that's definitely good news. But we also have to look at fiscal policy. And I think when people try and predict where Fed funds are going to be in six months or 12 months' time, it's impossible to make that prediction without knowing what's going to happen around the debt ceiling. And historically, if you look at periods of divided government with these debt ceiling negotiations, they've led to big fiscal tightenings in the U.S. Um, the last time it happened, the Fed actually did Operation Twist. 
Um, so we have to look at that as a major risk over the summer, specifically for the U.S., while in the rest of the world, you're seeing the fact of fiscal easing because energy prices are coming off very sharply. And I think that's what's leading to these divergent central bank behaviors. A lot of people disagree with you, George, in terms of just how far ahead in terms of economic positive surprises Europe is than the U.S., which is the reason why you see perhaps the potential for a lot more dollar weakness given the lack of pricing. How weak could the dollar get versus the euro later this year if what you expect to come to pass will? So I always like to invoke uh, the so-called 10 big figure rule for the euro. And historically, if you go back since 1999, since the euro's inception, the narrowest range the euro has done for a year is at least 10 big figures. And that is in a very low, volat low volatility environment. So in a normal year, we should be doing at least 15 big figures. Um, so implicit in our forecast is essentially a 105, 120 range. If we cannot break 105 to the downside, it must mean, I think, by extension, if history is anything to go by, uh, that the euro will have to enter into a 110, 120 range. And at the end of the day, if you take a step back, um, rate differentials are back to where they were this time um, 18 months ago. Energy prices have completely reversed. And back then, the euro was above 115. So it sounds like a, a large move. But if a lot of the moves from last year are reversing, and if anything, pointing to significantly tighter ECB policy versus the Fed, um, I think it's entirely possible. Just to frame your call, George, are you saying the high of the year becomes the floor of the range from here onwards? If 105 is the, is the low of, of the year, which I think is very possible, it must mean it is indeed the floor. And then by extension, if you start thinking fairly simplistically, 10 big figures, that will make 105, 115. But again, even that is, is too narrow. OK, George, good to catch up. Thanks for being with us, uh, George Saravellos there of Deutsche Bank. 110.33, the high of the year. We're just below those levels right now on the euro, going into payrolls on Friday. Have we announced our payrolls lineup yet? Have we done that? Have you done that I, earlier this week? You didn't do that? No, we haven't done that. To do it that? felt really far away for some reason. That's like, <laughs> no, no, I, I agree. <laughs> two days away. <laughs> Don't know. It's, it's like Every forever day. away. You know, we've got the IMF distraction coming up here with what we're going to do tomorrow. But you're distracted by week. that. No we're one else is. <laughs> but I'm sorry. You're right, John. And this is jobs day is not a small matter. So it's, we've got some special not, programming. I believe that special programming starts at 7 a.m. Eastern time. It goes through to 10. I hope it does, because that's when I'm going to arrive for work. Uh, Mohammed Alarian is <laughs> going to be with us in the studio. I'm learning That's very cool. What is this? That's going to be on Friday. On Friday. So Mohammed's going to be with us in the studio to break down that jobs number. Very good. Looking forward this to it. This is our team meeting. No, this is the promo. <laughs> this is the team meeting <laughs> also. Well. Yeah. Maybe we can make a graphic and make it really special. <laughs> Dougie Chowdhury of BlackRock in the next hour. Well Futures down. Machine. Two tenths of one percent. Good to have the group back together. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Donald Trump has denounced his indictment in New York as politically motivated, and he tried to link the case to grievances he has long deployed to hold sway over his supporters. The former president spoke at his estate in Florida hours after he pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. Taiwan calls President Tsai Ing-wen's meeting with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in the U.S. a rare opportunity. It may also lead to renewed military tension around the island. Tsai meets with McCarthy and other members of Congress today at the Reagan Library in Los Angeles. China has threatened an unspecified response. Voters in Chicago have elected progressive Brandon Johnson to be their next mayor. In a runoff, the Cook County commissioner defeated Paul Vallis, a former head of Chicago public schools, who made crime the focus of his campaign. Both are Democrats. Johnson wants to raise taxes on major corporations to boost Chicago's revenue. In the U.K., business confidence crept up in the first quarter of the year, but only a third of the firms saw an increase in sales. The survey from the British Chambers of Commerce shows how inflation is weighing on consumer spending decisions and adding to costs for companies. And Johnson & Johnson has agreed to pay $8.9 billion to resolve all cancer lawsuits tied to its talc face powders. The world's largest maker of health care products will also make a new attempt to contain the liability within a bankruptcy filing by one of its units. J&J &J hopes to settle complaints from about 60,000 plaintiffs. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
snapped a four-day rally on the S&P 500 in yesterday's session. Equity futures adding to the losses, just a touch, down about eight on the S&P. We're negative two-tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq. We're down two-tenths of 1% also. Just a little <clears throat> bit lighter, softer, negative down here. Into the bond market, twos, tens, thirties, shaping up as follows in the bond market this morning. Good morning to you all. Yield higher by five basis points, your two-year, 387.68. Yield to lower yesterday off the back of softer than anticipated data, Tom. I'm glad you bring up this board. And the answer is we got down to a 381, 382, and we haven't really penciled out yet the ramifications of so many charts, so many time series breaking down or up, depending on what the trend is. We just really, we're at support, we're at resistance, and what's it going to take to break through? At and the front end of the really curve, Tom, just to point out, started the week close to 4.1%. Yeah. So that's a real back away from that level at about yeah. 387 this morning. Off the back of week to the expected data, and to Lisa's point, and Lisa, I think you opened the show on the right point, the relationship between how, what developed in the bond market and what happened in the equity market, just a little different to what we've got used to this year. And this is what people are talking about, the potential for weaker economic data to speak to potentially weaker earnings and possible negativity for stocks, something that Mike Wilson and many others have been calling for, but hasn't come to pass yet. Yeah, but you wanted jobs openings to come down, Tom. You wanted to jump in there. No, no I, I, I think this is a really heated topic right now. We brought this up a couple of days ago, and with the jobs report coming up, this is this is going to be a really uh, foundational thing. But, John, I think there's just too much gloom here. We made up essentially half the cratered bear market in the first quarter. Yes, Apple went up a million percent. 20 stocks went up, according to Torsten Slack. But the rest of the market did really pretty darn good in repairing that crater of the end of 2022. Sure. No drama this morning. We're down about two tenths, Tom. Yeah, there we are. We've worked it down in the VIX 19.76 shows, a pretty good uh, bull market. To brief you on this, Kara Murphy joins us, Chief Investment Officer, Kestra Investment Management in Austin, wow. an advantage to be uh, distant from New York always. At least that's what we've learned <laughs> uh, over the years. Uh, let me start, Kara, with, as, as John was mentioning, the linkage here of economic data into the equity market. How are you using the economic data that indicates slowdown now? I think the first quarter, as you guys suggested, has been very perplexing. We had stocks that have rallied at the same time that we've had continued economic data that, that tells us to be cautious. The ISM manufacturing we just had come out a couple of days ago. It's below 50 for five months running now. That's a very strong signal that things are going to be weaker going forward. New orders also suggest additional weakness. We have an inverted yield curve for nine months, and by a large degree, that again has typically been a good sign of weakness. CapEx plans are declining. Now we have a banking crisis that's likely to lead to, to tighter credit standards. But I'll admit, all of that weakness on the sort of like industrial and commercial side is being offset by an incredibly strong consumer. You know, you were talking earlier about the labor market still remaining very strong. Wage growth continues to be very strong. Confidence is high. People are spending money, and this is a very consumer-driven economy. So yes, there's a lot of caution out there, but with the consumer so strong, that has continued to kind of pull this economic growth along. Can we start, Kara, by understanding the evolution of your position, the evolution of your portfolio over the past six months, say, how you came into the year and where you are now in your beliefs and your positioning? So earlier in the, for a while now, we've been fairly bullish on fixed income. You know, if you look at what the Fed has done over the last 15 months, they've had the sharpest and quickest uh, Fed rate tightening cycle that we've seen in generations, right? So all of that bad news is already in bond market. So, you know, we've been active on the fixed income side. Equities is where we've grown a little bit more cautious. We were seeing opportunities there. It, we think that there still are opportunities, but with this growing economic negative data with banking crisis likely to tighten credit standards. We've grown a little bit more cautious. And so we've kind of, you know, pulled in our reins a little bit. So could you talk about why now is different? Why in earlier in the year, bad news was good news for stocks. Why bad news now or softer economic data is now also bad news for stocks and that that shift has staying power? Yeah, so part of it is, as we said, the fundamental view of the economy. There are a lot more pressure as a recession seems more certain, but it's also what you're paying for it. So remember, with this rally, earnings have come down and valuations have gone up. So the attractiveness of stocks today is less than it was at the beginning of the year. So if we're going to be very valuation sensitive, we have fewer reasons to buy into the market today. 
So given that, how much are you actually leaning against the, the stocks that have done the best, the 20 stocks that have basically supported the entire gain in the equity market, as Tom was mentioning? Yeah, it's been really remarkable. I mean, we, we've called Q1 revenge of the growth stocks because it's the very narrow kind of band of stocks that really underperformed in 2022 and then had this enormous reversal in the first quarter and have led the market up. So what we're doing is really just kind of pulling in the reins. As I said, a little bit more, we're pretty equally weighted between growth and value. Um, we're overweighted large cap versus small cap. And then, of course, we're looking at opportunities outside the U.S. as well, where we think there's more valuation yeah. support and more bad news already baked in. Kara, one quick question. What are you doing with cash? I think that's a real mystery right now after the shock of the first quarter. Are you overweight cash and are your clients comfortable being there? So we are not overweight cash. We have a commitment to remain fully invested. So that's not a lever that we'll typically pull. But I will admit that there's a lot more discussion around cash today when you can get a 5% yield. It's a real asset class as before, you know, you couldn't count on anything. So I think it's being used more meaningfully in client portfolios. Well, not just semantics then, Kara. Can I be fully invested and have cash? Can't those two things go together now? Well, we're fully invested in stocks, bonds, all of that wonderful stuff, and we have cash to facilitate trading, but we're not going to take a large defensive cash position. Okay. Kara, great to catch up with you. Thanks for being with us. Kara Murphy there of Kestra Investment Management. You can get some return on cash. Being in cash doesn't mean what it used to mean, Lisa, over the last 12 months. It's a great point. People used to say cash would burn a hole in your portfolio. It would really eat into your returns. It doesn't eat into your returns so much when you're getting a 5% yield. At what point is cash no longer the attractive potential option versus stocks? What will it take? Will it take yields coming down or will it take valuations and stocks coming down or some combination of both? And those are sort of the risk-reward measurements that a lot of portfolio managers are taking. What do you make of the numbers, the pilot we've seen into money market funds over the last week or so, the last month for that matter? Lisa, does that speak to risk aversion around the banking story? Is that just a rates play that I can get that return now? What does that speak to? Both. I think more actually the the actual yield. And I think that's the bigger story than concern about the banking stability, which is the reason why even if you shore up all confidence in the banking system, there still will be a problem. And that's what people I, keep talking I, I, about. It, to me, it's a wonderful long-term return, not to what we knew 20 and 30 years ago, but to something new that hints to what we knew 20 or 30 years ago. I remember the absolute panic that money market funds would take over the world. And then there's dynamics and there's a break the buck fear or whatever changes uh, that around. And, and, and it's going to be original forward. But to your point, John, there's been a massive build out in money market funds. Jamie Diamond out with the annual letter yesterday, Tom. Covered JP Morgan. Co we, you know, you team, team coverage. Thing. Team coverage. What stuck out for you? Uh, what it looked out for me is he's running for Secretary of Treasury. You got the first top, which is the banking <laughs> analysis, and the middle we, part. Seriously, are we going there again? Yeah, we went there yesterday. And, you know, I, yeah, I think we are, to be honest. He's got a full page printout of a Wall Street Journal op ed in the letter. And the whole back end is on civics. We had a fun time with Richard Haas on this. It's like a civics lesson from Jamie Dimon, which is great. I'm not critical of it. But, you know, every year there's a theme. And this year's theme was democracy and uh, the nation into the 21st century. Well, how much daylight is there between PR for the individual running the company yeah. and PR for the overall uh, bank? You asked the delicate question. What do you think, Lisa? Up top, lots of touchy-feely, which is what you expect. I think that that's... That's exactly how I read it. I read it less as a pitch to run for president or campaign uh, for Treasury Secretary and more basically a pitch for the bank. Stop persecuting us because we're the yes. good actors and in you, all of yes. this. We're yes. the ones that have been bailing everyone out. So quit it already. Don't overregulate us. Don't be you know ridiculous yeah. with this. Don't levy us and, fees. Oh, and by the way, your regulations were what caused this and, precarious situation in the first place because you incentivized everyone to have huge portfolios of treasuries. And now you got losses that are marked to market. In the irony of the diamond level, Letter after what I observed in Zurich at the Credit Suisse annual meeting, I, I mean, you talk about a guy putting it out visible, clearly with emotion. You wish other bankers would do this. John, what did you I mean? You've covered this for years. I, mean, I guess Manus is over there uh, now. I, uh, that was stunning. And I've never seen that yesterday. It's going to take, what, never four seen. years to put these two institutions together? What's interesting yeah. about the recent 
re- the recent reporting is just how quickly they got in touch with Sergio Armati. Uh-huh. You know, it was like, this might be on the cards. And how Cole Cole Kelleher basically was preparing for this well ahead of time. Three months earlier, right? That was some of the reporting that he was well in advance talks about this. And then all of a sudden the the Swiss National Bank comes out and says, yeah, they were just a minute away from bankruptcy potentially. I mean, really? My, My amateur take is it's more cultural than we think. We're trying to do finance and analysis and all that. And I, I don't get the Swissness of this. I don't really understand other than every report is the Swiss people are just absolutely furious. I wonder how, th- how true that is. You know, when we come on TV, <clears throat> Swiss people hate it. You know, they hate the gnomes. it. We should bring yeah, someone. And then you go and sort of bump into someone in Switzerland and they're like, I just couldn't care less. Some of my best friends are Swiss. No. I mean, it's <laughs> no. true. We should, we should bring someone on and actually ask them how they feel about it rather than they saying their emotions. It. I'm told they hate it. <laughs> well, you know, look, this is a banking Can culture I, and now they have a bank yeah. one after losing the other. From the UBS peak, I'm doing this off the ADR of February of this year. They're up 12% off the bottom, and they're only 5 maybe 6% from a new high recovery on UBS. I, I mean, I, the, the market, I would suggest, is liking this in some form of UBS recovery. I also wonder whether we've actually moved on. The fact that the uh, contingent capital bonds have all recovered almost entirely, the losses from Credit Suisse's debacle, are we looking at Credit Suisse as really... I hate to say the I word. I'm going to say the I word. Ooh. Idiosyncratic amid Drinking a game. sea of, uh, of concerns <clears throat> with respect okay. to the banking industry. It's different than what we saw in the U.S. I'm going to say the I word. Mm. I think it actually is well, deserved here. Then. Why? I just said just, idiosyncratic. Oh, great. Thanks for that. Say it twice. Just, I think it's embarrassing for the Swiss. I thought it was going to be embarrassing for me to no, say the no, I word. No, I think it's incredibly <laughs> embarrassing for the Swiss. I would agree. Are you done? What is that? It's tang, tang free. I don't think anyone having, wants to hear that in the morning. What is t- that? She said it idiosyncratic. Uh, it's a drinking game. Okay. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks for that. All right. Christina Campmany, haven't missed this. <laughs> I mean, is going to join us in the next hour. Looking forward to that. Equity futures down about two tenths of one percent. You can clear your throat out to break if you want. Do you want to do that? Clearing my throat. Get, get that down the microphone the too. Okay. That's not clearing Thanks. my throat. Mm. That's like you know. Yields up a couple of basis points. The ten-year three thirty-six from New York City. Manus Cranny joining us out of Switzerland shortly. He's in Zurich. I believe so. Then on to payrolls on Friday. Just a couple of days away. you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. From a New York courtroom to the campaign stage in Florida, Donald Trump has put his comeback bid for the White House back in the forefront. After pleading not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records in Manhattan, the former president spoke to a crowd of supporters at his Mar-a-Lago resort in Palm Beach, where he called the indictment politically motivated. In Wisconsin, Democrats have won a majority on the Supreme Court for the first time in 15 years. And it comes as justices will consider a case that could determine access to abortion. The two candidates in the Wisconsin race spent $28 million, making it the most expensive state Supreme Court case in U.S. history. The U.S. will provide Ukraine with another $2.6 billion in military aid. The package includes more ammunition for the HIMARS missile system, air defense interceptors, and artillery rounds. Ukraine has emphasized the need to boost its air defenses. In China, another sign that the crackdown on corruption in the financial sector is picking up pace. Authorities have launched an investigation into the former chairman and party chief of state-owned China Everbright Group. That comes after anti-corruption regulators began a fresh round of checks at more than 30 state-owned companies. And UBS chairman Colm Kelleher says the integration of Credit Suisse will take three to four years. And that doesn't include the wind-down of the investment bank. Kelleher is speaking today at UBS's annual general meeting. He says that even with protection in the form of Swiss government support, there's a huge amount of risk in that deal. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
think the theme that continues from last year into this year is one of uncertainty. What's emerged is the link between rate hikes and a slower economy. You throw on that now, this banking crisis or the banking turmoil that we've had, and now you're talking about another layer of risk to economic growth. I don't really think the consumer is about to fall off the cliff here. We expect a slowdown, pretty substantial slowdown, but we are not expecting an outright contraction. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Seeing signs of that slowdown this week, that's for sure. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keen. <clears throat> And Lisa Brownwoods, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures down about a tenth of 1% on the S&P. TK, the appetizer before the main event, the main course on Friday. And the, and the main event is more important than it was two weeks ago. All of a sudden, I would suggest Monday, maybe it was Friday last, Jobs Day has taken on a new importance. And one reason is it's the only jobs report to the May 3rd meeting. This is the last real substantial look at the labor market that this Federal Reserve gets. It's about getting a decent understanding, Lisa of what the condition of this economy was going into this banking stress. I think that's worth pointing out because I think we've also got to ask, after the banking stress of the last month, how redundant is Friday's number? Well, and that's actually what John Authors was talking about, this idea that the jolt survey was a bit of both sugar and caffeine because it was sugar saying, OK, you are seeing the labor market <clears throat> loosen the way the Fed wants. But the extra sugar and the caffeine is that this is backward looking. <clears throat> it doesn't even capture yeah. in what we've already seen. So, again, how much do people trade off a data that point that's backward looking and that potentially doesn't factor in what we're going to say? I was walking down the street yesterday in the first decent day in New York here on the edge of summer, maybe in the edge of spring even. It's been so cold. And I was thinking of the single most important thing, John, I've heard this week. David Kelly, J.P. Morgan Asset Management, looked for negative non-farm payroll prints out there somewhere. To me, that's the single most important thing this market isn't ready for. Well, you've got to talk about the Canada, Tom. When? A month? The when, two no, months, no, no, no. Out. Three months? He made clear. Andrew Hoddenhorst, the city, is talking Q, about weakness Q. that doesn't show up until 2024. Yeah, We mentioned this in the last hour, and I think it's important to go over. We spent the last 12 months talking about the long and variable lags of interest rate hikes. What about the <clears> long and variable lags of banking shocks? How quickly is this going to show up in the economy? I think it's going to diffuse across assets, as we mentioned in the last hour. And I don't think it's a tip point because we've been through this before. But commercial real estate, mortgage bank, the land of Chris Whalen. The land of Chris Whalen is what I'm looking at. A derivative instruments in real estate investment in America – typically to the major regionals and the regionals and the smaller banks. I'm sorry, that is an exposure that to me is the follow-on of the quote-unquote banking crisis. The ADP report comes out a little bit later this morning. Lisa's going to go through the data in just a moment. Here's a flavor of the price action for you. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Equity futures right now down about a tenth of 1%, recovering just a little bit, though, on the S&P. Still yesterday, a day of losses, snapping a four-day winning streak on the S&P 500. Longest winning streak going back to January four days, believe it or not. This market's been so choppy over the yep. last month or so. In the bond market, yields a little bit higher against the trend of the last week or so. 336.28 on a US 10-year. <clears throat> Yesterday, two-year yields, Lisa, much, much lower off the back of that weekday to this morning higher by about five basis points. And the fact that we saw lower yields yesterday amid comments from Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester uh, saying that they expect to raise rates above 5% and hold them there for a long time shows this credibility gap that seems to be opening up between the market and what the Fed is saying. Loretta Mester speaks again, uh, although today with Bloomberg's own Michael McKee at 8.30 a.m. So interested to hear what she has to say, given uh, what the market seems to be screaming, how much does she push back? On the geopolitical point of view, French President Emmanuel Macron is traveling to China. Uh, uh, we also see that Ursula von der Leyen of the European Commission is going to be joining him. This, to me, is an interesting juxtaposition at a time when the Taiwan president is in the U.S. and is being met by House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. How much of a unity is there really between the U.S. and Europe when it comes to discussing and negotiating with China, given the differentials in reliance economically on that nation? And today on the economic data front, we do get ADP employment data that nobody cares about until they do. 8.15 a.m. Is it going to give us more of the same flavor that we got yesterday from that JOLTS data? And then ISM services coming in uh, for the month of March at 10 a.m. Really curious to see 
whether we start to actually put more weight on jolts, where a lot of people said, this is a survey that is very messy. <laughs> this is a basically companies throwing darts at a board saying we need to blanket the uh, field with potential applications because we're just not getting enough qualified workers. So do we get anything from this survey in terms of the trend in some of the other harder data? Hi, Lisa. Thanks for that. Looking ahead to that economic data a little bit later. And Lisa, thank you also for including Macron going to China. <clears throat> Tom, the chaos of the last month, yeah. the banking system here in the United States, I would say the drama of yesterday politically here right. in New York, there were really important things going on geopolitically. I think of China. China brokering a deal between Saudi and Iran, barely talked about right. because right. of the banking situation right. 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 here. Macron to China, hardly talked about because of the politics here. But these are important issues. Good time to mention this here. I think you're 100% correct. It's been a huge divergence. Yesterday was just nuts the number of stories. Tomorrow, a conversation with Kristalina Gorgieva, John about just what you said. I will begin with China and I will stay on China because it is the theme of the spring meetings and frankly, onto the October meetings in Morocco. And then Finland and NATO. We well. did that yesterday. Yeah, these are kind of I things from just, just kind of slip beneath the radar because we're so focused on these hyper divisive issues in places here like New York. Uh, and I, the drama of yesterday. I, we did it yesterday, and I'm really proud of our team for picking up that video that we saw from uh, NATO, as we saw Secretary of State Blinken with the leaders of leadership of NATO raise that Blue Cross flag, John. But I, I 100% agree with you that within the cacophony, we still have to look international. We'll catch up with AMH in about 10 minutes from now. We'll pick up on some of that. Looking forward to it. Joining us now is Gargi Chowdhury, the head of iShares Investment Strategy Americas at BlackRock. <coughs> Gargi, wonderful to catch up with you, and good to see you, as always. Gargi, I think we all want to know just how much demand is there still for treasuries based on what you're seeing. Good morning, guys. It's great to be here. And a tremendous amount of demand is what I'm going to say. So just looking at ETF flows for the first quarter of the 74 odd billion that came into all ETFs, about 70 percent of that was in fixed income. And more specifically, what I thought at least was really interesting was that investors gravitated towards the highest quality parts of the fixed income market. So you were seeing investors move towards government bonds, towards treasuries, towards the very front end of the treasury curve, and then the belly, so the 7 to 10 year, something like the IEF, which gives you exposure to the 10 year part of the curve, had its biggest <clears throat> inflow ever. So investors definitely want fixed income right. here. They want the highest quality fixed income and they want treasuries at these, uh, well, not great yields, but better yields than it was about a year ago. So Gargi, within crisis and within fear, we need to find courage. What part of the <laughs> ETF world is, is the courage need to be applied? Where should we be investing away from our full faith and credit fears? Sure, John, you're absolutely right. I think investors need to stay invested. I think one thing we've learned, especially when we look at the price action in both January as well as March, where we wouldn't have necessarily expected the S&P to be up or the NASDAQ to be up as much as it was. So now where should investors go in this slightly volatile environment? We look at that in our second quarter outlook that we just came out with. Number one, Think about quality in the equity markets and the fixed income markets. So within the equity market that looks at companies that have strong cash flows, high margins, and really have the ability to have strong balance sheets. So looking at quality as well as looking at growth companies, not just tech, but all growth companies that are at, at a reasonable price. And that can be tech, something like an IXN, but also can be global energy companies like an IXC. So that's the equity side. And then on the fixed income side, you guys know this. I've talked about this on your show a bunch. We think that the new regime is one of you should be buying every backup in yields. I think we're in a generational opportunity for investors to get really high quality income in the fixed income markets. Today's yield levels, not fantastic. I think the Fed is not going to cut two and a half uh, times by the end of this year. But every time we get a backup, buy bonds, buy the front end, and when we get to about 4%, buy the ag. And Gargi, certainly index strategies work very well when you're talking about broad uh, bond indexes. But does index-based investing allow for the stock-specific type of analysis that you're talking about? Do you see investors starting to shift away from equity-indexed strategies as they start to shift toward greater quality? 
It's a great question, Lisa. So I'd say that uh, obviously, I mean, this was a great month. Uh, March was a great month for uh, inflows into QUAL quality tickers. And if we look at broad mutual funds as well as ETF uh, industries, I mean, there has been an outflow from mutual funds as such and mutual funds and ETFs when it comes to U.S. equity specifically. But I think the crux of your question is, you know, is there a role for both active as well as index investing for investors' portfolios? And the answer is absolutely yes. So one of the things that I'm most passionate about is the fact that investors can add ETFs to their portfolios, iShares ETFs, hopefully in their portfolios, active investors can do that to generate alpha in a really liquid manner in their portfolio. So yes, you can have your active allocations, but there is a role for ETFs, for liquidity, for access, for transparency as well. Agagi, just to pick up on some of the words you used, I think this is important. You called this a generational opportunity, which implies mm -hmm. that maybe it doesn't stick around that you have to get in now to pick up <laughs> yield. But then you said by the front end, which made me think, well, OK, if you're only buying the front end, you're not really locking it in for very long. Gargi, which yeah. one is it? Is it a once in a generation opportunity or something that's <laughs> going to stick around? So I really hope that it sticks around. But unfortunately, every time what we've seen is as soon as yields back up to about that 4% level, we have investors, both <clears> from sort of institutional investors that are pension funds, insurance companies, as well as retail investors, gravitate towards the ag, gravitate towards duration. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we do get that back up, and I think we will most likely get a back up back to about 3.7 to 4% once some of this fear around the banking crisis has dissipated somewhat. Um, so I, I think that it's a generational opportunity when we get that back up. But for now, you should still be invested in fixed income. So for now, I think allocating to the front end makes a lot of sense. Gagi, thank you. Always enjoy catching up with you. Gagi Chowdhury there of BlackRock Absolutely. on the bond market. Lisa? I always love it when everyone's saying we're waiting for the opportunity to get in when, they, exactly. when things sell off. Thank you. And then they never sell off because everybody's looking for that opportunity and continuing to buy. Just saying. It speaks to that wall of demand and fixed exactly. income that Gagi started the uh, conversation with, Tom. Everybody's, I mean, the, the caution out there is off the chart. What does that mean for equities? How do you sell equities into that gloom? Right, you know. Well, you didn't in Q1, looking at the Certainly. NASDAQ, right? And as, I believe we're still gloomy. I don't know. Somebody can correct me on that. I think we've got to acknowledge that the data was weak this week. I think yeah. you've got to acknowledge that. And clearly the bond market traded on it. And equities too, which is new. Equity futures right now down about a tenth of 1%. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Donald Trump has denounced his indictment in New York as politically motivated, and he tried to link the case to grievances he has long deployed to hold sway over his supporters. The former president spoke at his estate in Florida hours after he pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. Taiwan calls President Tsai Ing-wen's meeting with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in the U.S. a rare opportunity. It may also lead to renewed military tension around the island. Tsai, Tsai meets with McCarthy and other members of Congress today at the Reagan Library in Los Angeles. China has threatened an unspecified response. Voters in Chicago have elected progressive Brandon Johnson to be their next mayor. In a runoff, the Cook County Commissioner defeated Paul Vallis, a former head of Chicago Public Schools, who made crime the focus of his campaign. Both are Democrats. Johnson wants to raise taxes on major corporations to boost Chicago's revenue. France's President Emmanuel Macron is in Beijing, where he told the French community that China can play a major role in Ukraine. He also said he opposes moves to decouple the world's second largest economy. Macron has been pushing Europe to take a more moderate stance toward China than the U.S. And Johnson & Johnson has agreed to pay $8.9 billion to resolve all cancer lawsuits tied to its talc-based powders. The world's largest maker of health care products will also make a new attempt to contain the liability. Within a bankruptcy filing by one of its units, J&J hopes to settle complaints from about 60,000 plaintiffs. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. Under New York state law, it is a felony to falsify business records with intent to defraud and an intent to conceal another crime. That is exactly what this case is about. The only crime that I have committed is to fearlessly defend our nation from those who 
seek to destroy it. That was Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg with the former president, Donald Trump, responding to the indictment against him in remarks last night from Mar-a-Lago, Florida. Live from New York City this morning, good morning and welcome to the program. Equity futures on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. Equity futures look <coughs> a little something like this, down six or seven points. We're down about... A tenth of 1%, let's call it down two tenths of 1% on the S&P. Yields are higher by a single basis point, maybe even two, if we squeeze an extra one out for you. 335.53 on a 10-year, the two-year. Then we all have to talk about what happened at the front end of the curve yesterday and the relationship between the bond market and equities. Lisa, the data was weaker, the bond market rallied, that makes sense. Then something else made sense too, and it typically doesn't. The equity market started to weaken a little bit as well. This, to me, is one of the biggest shifts. And if it sticks, this will be a tipping point where suddenly, you know, weaker economic data is bad news for stocks, which was not the case earlier in the year. Suddenly, is there a question about what it will take for the Fed to come in and cut rates or even not hike, what that means for the condition of the economy? Bad news is bad news. I mean, we'll see how long this sticks. We've seen this before. We still continue to get pushback from Fed officials saying that they're still going to raise rates. The market keeps pushing back. Right. And what do they get in, in terms of how bad the economic data gets for them to be able to, you know, get with the market? We, we don't have the time to dive into this right now, but it's a source of huge debate. And I would just say I have never seen, John, the navel gazing of trying to get a Fed interest rate turn. Never seen it. I've just never observed clearly with an inflation out there that's sticky at 4% where we're trying to model out the quote, when do they cut, when do they pivot, whatever language you want to use it. To me, it's absolutely original, the debate. The market doesn't get to wait until the May <clears throat> meeting. Markets don't get to wait until the next dot plot. The market has concluded, a lot of people have concluded behind these market pricing that ultimately what we've seen develop in the last month or so will lead to a disinflationary bust. It doesn't mean that's what's going to happen, Lisa. It just seems to be reflected in the price action of the last month or so. And that's the reason why I thought that the Western Alliance statement was interesting yesterday. And I keep going back to the banks because the bank stocks really underperformed yesterday. So it was a departure from some of the recovery trade that we had been seeing. Western Alliance did not give guidance about how many uh, deposits they continue to see flowing out. This is the question. It is not necessarily because of the weakness of a bank. It is because of what we're seeing with money moving and banks unwilling or unable to lend. Right now we're going to digress. And yes, we will go to the moment witnessed yesterday in Manhattan. She is in Los Angeles, which could basically be called Eastern Taipei, Eastern uh, Taiwan, far across the Pacific Ocean. Taiwan has moved 80,000 plus people into the nation, into California. It's a huge population uh, in force in California. Today, there's policy, politics there for balance of power. Anne-Marie Horton, Horton joining us uh, right now. Anne-Marie, I want to get away from the Trump uh, story and go to the McCarthy story here. McCarthy's meeting the leader of Taiwan. The symbolism is immense, and Beijing has noticed, haven't they? Yeah, symbolism is immense because this is historic in the sense that we've never seen a Taiwanese leader meet a Speaker of the House on U.S. soil, and obviously he's the third-ranking highest U.S. official. And leading up to this moment, what we've been hearing from the White House is they're saying nothing to see here, basically. They, the uh, Taiwanese president, Tsai Ing-wen, she is just transiting through the United States and goes to visit other democracies in Central America and these meetings. But obviously this one everyone has been waiting for. It's the most controversial, and it is the one that China is watching the most. And they say they will respond in kind, and there will be consequences. So there is this potential that we could see a little bit of what we saw last summer when Speaker Pelosi visited <coughs> Taiwan, and that was massive military drills, mm -hmm. uh, firing of rockets. But this likely will be slightly more muted because at the end of the day, it is taking place on U.S. soil. Right. Emory, it's 6,800 miles from Taipei to Los Angeles. It's 100 miles across the Formosa Strait. What is the new military presence backing up Mr. McCarthy's meeting with Mr. Tsai? Well, there's a huge Chinese military presence there. Um, we know that, and they wanted that on full display during Speaker Pelosi's visit. When you come to the United States, though, um, if you've been following the tea leaves of what Lloyd Austin's been up to, the Secretary of Defense, he's made a trip out to the Philippines. There was recent reporting as well. They were fortifying uh, some military base, an air base there in the Philippines. This is the U.S. new military posture, taking another look at how the U.S. has a presence in the Pacific. 
how symbolic is it, Anne Marie, that you have uh, the Taiwanese President Tsai in Los Angeles, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy there to meet her, at the same time that you've got Emmanuel <clears throat> Macron, other European representatives heading over to Beijing to uh, try to negotiate more closely with Xi Jinping? Is this potentially problematic, indicating some sort of fissure between the two powers? Well, it's certainly an interesting split screen. Um, as you can see there, because China obviously is against this visit from the Taiwanese president. They say there'll be consequences. And he, she is also, Tsai Ing-wen, is also not just meeting with Speaker McCarthy. It's going to be a group of bipartisan representatives in New York. She also met with bipartisan senators. This was about Taiwanese security. There's a bill right now circulating um, in Congress about standing with Taiwan, being able to send more weapons, being able to send sanctions to uh, Communist Party officials, as well as Chinese uh, finance industry and companies if the U.S. deems that China crossed a line and did, in fact, one day invade Taiwan. As you say, at the same time, you have not just Emmanuel Macron that is in Beijing, but also Ursula von der Leyen. You see the U.S. administration has been trying to get these European leaders on board with how they want to approach China. But at the same time, I think it shows that China's economy is so important for not just the U.S., which has massive trade with it, but the entire world and critically for Europe as well. I'm actually looking forward to your coverage through today. <coughs> Anne-Marie over in Los Angeles this morning, not in Washington, D.C., on tour, following the on speaker. Tour. Bounce of power on tour. It's going to be exciting going to the election. She and Joe Matthew have a little bit to talk about. And, John, you were talking about the international affairs yesterday. I, the the number of, not major, but the number of separate stories yesterday, maybe in 20-plus years, I've never seen. We had seven, eight, nine things going on at once. Well, here's an important Including one. our core coverage. And, Lisa, I'd ask the question that basically you were leaning towards. China talks about consequences. What are the consequences? Today. Have they spelled out these consequences? Well, there was a report uh, out just in the past half hour that Emmanuel Macron is saying that Xi Jinping is not going to overreact to uh, Taiwanese President Tsai in the U.S., that this is not going to be something in the forefront. Very difficult right. to know how you de-escalate, though, from here. And if you think about hanging out there in the back, TikTok and a potential ban, how do you place some of the business interests the U.S. has over in China with this increasing ratcheting up of tensions? I don't know how we get yeah. back down from this, given that it is bipartisan. I went back and forth with Maria today on Brussels covering Finland uh, yesterday, and we were talking about, well, they've gone through the party congress, they've gone through the anointing of Xi as a lifetime leader of China, whatever that politics is going to be. And now is the micro testing every day, every week, every month of the West with many micro tests of what is the new China going to look like forward. And I think you see that in the, the stew of visits and meetings, including what we're going to see next week at the IMF. What are we going to see with TikTok? What's happening there? We've had the I, hearings, they've all got together. I'm a just not up to speed through. on it. Full disclosure, I, I, I just would like to get rid of it. That's my dad kind of thing. Oh, you think but it should go? That's your view. <clears throat> I I don't have an opinion, but so let's get to. I mean, the look, I'm watching Instagram <laughs> be. Dist I'm, I'm look. I'm Rub watching Instagram. Here, <laughs> I want. I mean, Lisa's more up to speed on this than I am, but I, I Instagram has changed. Facebook has changed. They're all changing in reaction to TikTok. Do we ban it? I don't think we can ban it. I think it's delusional. If you force a sale, what is the consequence? What is the repercussions over in China? And here, I just don't have any visibility in terms house. of Apple, in terms They're of some Facebook of the businesses. That's well, what's happen. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. That's the whole point. They can't because it's not there. Precisely. So then what do you do with Apple? What do you do with the other big tech companies that do a lot of business in China? Please run the same way. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Equity features on the S&P, down a tenth of 1%. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. Everybody's down yesterday, a little bit softer this morning. We're down about a tenth of 1%. Good morning to you. Your broader market shaping up as follows. Equities down on the S&P, on the NASDAQ. We're down about a tenth of 1% on the NASDAQ 100. If you look at the bond market, <coughs> twos, tens and thirties shaping up as follows. On a two-year, 384.79, up a couple of basis points. Down yesterday, down in a big way. Crushed. Started the week at about 4.1%, backed away off the back of weak data. The ISM. Job openings, factory orders. We'll get another ISM later, this time for the services. 
sector. Looking forward to that. Your tenure just sub 335. Let's finish on foreign exchange. Euro dollar. George Saravelos of Deutsche Bank talking up Eurozone exceptionalism for the right reasons. And Lisa, for a long time, we talked about Eurozone exceptionalism for all the wrong reasons. And now it's about Europe and why we should pay attention to the labour market data in the European economy. George Cervello is saying that European wage gains are outpacing the U.S.'s for the first time in more than a decade, just to give you a sense of how unusual this is. And he's not alone with saying that Europe potentially holds more growth in the U.S. So another 50 from the ECB and a pause from the Fed? OK, well, then when do we start talking <clears throat> about the extra 50 causing slower growth going forward in the ECB. But you're right. That's that's basically what you were asking when you were in London. How much are we going to see the ECB hiking more uh, than the Federal Reserve? I want to take a look at some stocks that I think are really important to uh, keep track of. Remember when we used to talk about banks? We are going to talk about banks once again because Western Alliance yesterday gave their earnings and what they didn't give is what's spooking markets. They failed to give an explicit deposit balance. And people are wondering, what are you hiding? Those shares down 4.6 percent. And it speaks to perhaps not a lack of confidence in smaller banks, but just a lack of flows into them at a time when you can get yield elsewhere. What does that mean for lending? You're seeing PacWest, another one of those banks uh, that was really struggling in the face of uh, some of the jitters down about eight tenths of a percent. In sympathy, NVIDIA also is really interesting to watch because you saw Japan join with the West to ban certain shipmaking supplies into China. And you see uh, what is going on with NVIDIA, those shares down by 1.7%. We are not done yet with this trade war. We are not done yet with this ratcheting up, this escalating escalation with respect to certain nations versus China. This, to me, is one of the most underplayed stories of this year. And, John, I keep going back to this, especially given that <clears throat> on the geopolitical scale next week, that is what the IMF, that is what the World Bank, that is what all of them are going to be talking about. Next week is huge. I'm pleased you brought up some of these issues, particularly on the banking side as well, Lisa. Next week, First Republic earnings, I think, on the 13th. Then on the 14th, Tom J.P. Morgan. On the 12th, I think we have CPI yeah. as well. Oh. And I might go as far as saying that maybe the guidance from the banks might be more important than payrolls on Friday and CPI next week, Tom, because there's going to be a sense in a lot of people, not everyone, but for many, particularly those that come on this program, who believe that a lot of this economic data is dated. It's about getting a decent picture of the condition of the economy going into the banking stress. The condition but to get an idea about what the banking stress will do to the economy, you've got to look to the banks for that. The, the condition of the economy to get the banks right sized and straightforward, and then to see what corporations will do, John, as you mentioned, JP Morgan kicking off earnings. Maybe Federal Express is getting out from this. This is a bombshell from FedEx moments ago. I've got a raising of the dividend 10 percent. This is basically all hell breaking loose at our blue chip companies, John, is they adapt to this new world. Do I sense some sarcasm there, Tom? No, I, I, I think this is what I've been talking about, which is corporations with a vengeance will adapt to the cards that they're dealt, the things that we talk about back and forth every day on surveillance. That stock up, Tom, a little more than 3% in the pre-market. Yeah, we'll have to see there. We've got a wonderful guest with us. We're going to dive into the detail on FedEx with our team and get back to you with a full report in moments. Christina Katmany joins us right now, Senior Portfolio Manager for Global Debt at Invesco. I'm going to dovetail these two stories in here. And my question with all that you see at Invesco is what is the level of flight to quality now? If it's flight to quality in April, are we all going to react, including the leadership of Federal Express? Look, I, I think there is this, we had so much concern in this banking crisis story that took over the market really in March. When we take a step back, the macro underneath hasn't changed as much. Um, and what's driving the Fed, and we obviously have to see the specifics from the bank and what's the tightening that comes as a result, but that's going to be a slow go and not something we'll get hints of it from the tones of Jamie Dimon in his letter yesterday and things like that with earnings. But we won't have it in the nitty gritty data and it's going to take a while. So we're left with looking at the hard data that we have and wondering if that can slow. And from a rates perspective, as you guys were talking about this morning, do we think treasuries themselves are super attractive? I don't know, 30s with the curve as inverted? Not really, but. CDs, you can get CDs at 5%, and you can have some of these bank accounts at smaller banks if you have a level of comfort. And the FDIC has certainly given more of that to the market, are earning 4 5% too, right? So there is, right. I think there's that level of flight to quality, but I think some of the broader panic in the market has 
kind of come back a bit. If we begin with the idea we're not going to return to the low rate regime of 15 years, whatever that mm -hmm. timeline is, and we're going to go out to something new, it's not going to be what I remember in my youth. But it is going to be something different, which is a normalized high rate regime. How strategically does someone scared stiff play that event? You know, I think we're in a different world, as you said, and I think it's hard to see. We've kind of shrunk the tails on both sides, whereas even coming into this year in January, there was the concerns of, do you have a Fed that can potentially go to six or six and a half or seven percent? And what does that mean? And do you have a corporate market collapse as a result? I think we've reined in that tail and that's what the March event has done. And at the same time, it's really hard to see us going back to the zero lower bound because in, we're in a structurally higher inflation environment. So we're kind of navigating the middle. And I think we get, as investors, you get used to, okay, what, what are our options there? Risk-free assets become more interesting because they're not at the zero lower bound. You talked about um, Europe, and is Europe finally more interesting? Like the the government bond world in Europe becomes more interesting just as a fact of not being in negative yields for the first time in years, right? <laughs> for their home base investors and central banks and whatnot. May third, Federal Reserve. How much information are they going to have to make a decision? <clears throat> Again, not not as much as they'd like, I'm sure. Um, I think from the banking side, and look, I think the central banks, what we got from the policy meetings in March is this effort to compartmentalize the two issues and say, we have inflation as a problem, and we have policy rates to address that, and we have systemic issues, and we have our other special tools. And in Europe, it's LTROs, and here we had action from the Treasury and the Fed and FDIC and all these things. So I think the mes that messaging from the ECB was a bit clearer and crisper than from Powell. Um, but I think to get the, the information in the U.S., especially of what credit tightening has actually impacted the market from the banks is just going to take time. And we don't have that hard data. And I think the Fed continues to pound the table that they are concerned about inflation and they do not have tools if inflation is, they, they are more concerned with letting inflation get out of control. So it's a measured, like 50 is not on the table for the Fed, but can, should they should they and will they likely go 25? I think that that's the case. And from there, it's about the data. Payrolls is less important, yep. but the market's still looking for a 200 plus number, right? Like the economy to stay at steady pace is, 70, is 75, right? Like you're still talking about running much above what, what the economy needs at a flat rate. At least a 240 is the estimate for Friday. And to Christina's point, the Fed totally blurred the lines between the financial <laughs> issues and the monetary policy objectives by saying that the financial issues were a substitute to some extent for rate hikes. And actually reflecting that, as you pointed out, in the projections coming down about 50 basis points in terms of the median dot, which raises a question uh, as an investor, if you're saying, you know, a professional investor is saying, those CDs look pretty good, not what you normally hear from a bond investor. <laughs> at what point can you go into riskier credit at a time when perhaps people are mispricing treasuries, given where the Fed is potentially going to go, and given that people haven't adequately priced in what it would take to bring down inflation? Yeah. So I think we look at it in, in two senses. So the market likes to talk about here's where Fed pricing is. So this is the direct path that the market's pricing. And we kind of look at it more of the market pricing is this bimodal, right? We have the scenario that the Fed, in fact, stays on hold close to the levels that they are for some period of time. And we think that that's a higher probability event. And then there's the tail on the other side that things really do break and they have to cut meaningfully. And it's not that they may have to cut 200, 400 basis points similar to 01. So is our base case that they cut the 85-ish basis points that are priced into the market currently? No, that's not our base case. I think that's the tail, and I think that that's the divergence of how the market thinks about it. Um, and you you asked on something else, too. But um, I, I think that you're, you're sitting next to me. You're allowed to forget what was said. Okay, if you're sitting next to me, you can... Or you just make up your own questions. You make up your own questions. <laughs> that's what Tom does often. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but I think like that, that's the push and pull of where we go from here, of which is the path. And then from an inflation perspective, you know, inflation's still running high. I think inflation bonds look interesting still. And we, we still think that the biggest um, 
whereas we've said this before too, 2022 was a year of clear duration trade that you can make. I think 2023 remains FX as the primary market that will be the mover and the transition mechanism of the divergence of central bank policy and what's the most interesting. Underpinning that, when you joined us last time, you mm -hmm. talked about the importance of the property market mm -hmm. for foreign exchange. Commercial real estate, is it a part of that for you? Can you build an FX story off the back of what you think is going to happen with commercial real estate? I think it, it impacts it for sure. And I think that there's different levels of importance in different markets. But I think, again, like you look at the consumer in the U.S., the consumer is such a large part of the market and housing. Um, I was listening, I think, to one of the Odd Lots podcasts this week, and they were talking about how um, the homeowner is the biggest political contingent and lobby in, in the market. And it's yeah. true, right? Like you have the consumer, you have these housing markets. So I think that that story for the UK and Canada and Australia, that remains true and anchors that there are some real divergences between these markets. Oh, particularly in the UK, where they would de-emphasize the equity market and say, I feel rich based on how expensive my house is worth. Yeah. Not whether I'm tapping into the equity, Lisa, just how expensive that house is worth. That's what I derive my wealth from. Which is why the recent decline in home prices in the UK is so interesting. How yeah. much does that actually act as a tightening? That acts as a rate hike by the uh, mm -hmm. by the Bank of England. People like are confidence about, issues. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's my point. A massive confidence issues. Christina, this was great. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you as always, Christina Campmelli of Invesco. Back to that real estate theme for you, Tom. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I. I think there's any number of ways to go here on the real estate thing, and it's something we have to follow city by city. And yes, follow Blackstone. They're making the headlines. There's no question about it. But this is not going away. This is our, one of our themes. 8.30 the Eastern Time. Yeah. We'll get some data for you at 8.15, and then 8.30 we'll catch up with the Cleveland Fed President, Loretta Mester, with Mike McKee. Looking forward to that. Coming up in the next hour. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. From a New York courtroom to the campaign stage in Florida, Donald Trump has put his comeback bid for the White House back in the forefront. After pleading not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records in Manhattan, the former president spoke to a crowd of supporters at his Mar-a-Lago resort in Palm Beach, where he called the indictment politically motivated. In Wisconsin, Democrats have won a majority on the Supreme Court for the first time in 15 years. And it comes as justices will consider a case that could determine access to abortion. The two candidates in the Wisconsin race spent $28 million, making it the most expensive state Supreme Court case in U.S. history. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky is visiting Poland, one of the country's strongest allies. Zelensky is discussing defense and economic cooperation. And he'll sign a deal on supplies, including armored personnel carriers. UBS chairman Colm Kelleher says the integration of Credit Suisse will take three to four years. And that doesn't include the wind down of the investment bank. Kelleher is speaking today at UBS's annual general meeting. He says that even with protection in the form of Swiss government support, there's a huge amount of risk in the deal. And a new study says that Americans are spending less time working than they did before the pandemic. Some are spending more time on leisure activities, and that's led to a shortfall of labor. The study says it's equivalent to 2.4 million employees, and that adds pressure in a hot labor market that the Fed wants to cool off as it fights inflation. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. It's more than an obligation to, to follow the law. Donald Trump has been a serial violator uh, of obligations. Uh, you know, the idea of norms, the peaceful transfer of political power. Obligations, though, are something citizens have to insist upon, and that brings it all back to the ballot box. The law, though, is something else, and we have a system for dealing with it. That's why we have courts. Richard Haas there, the Council on Foreign Relations president, joining us in the last day or so from New York City. Let's check out the market for you. Equity futures down a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. Bit of news from FedEx moments ago. Tom, consolidating <coughs> operating companies, raising a dividend big time. That dividend's going up at 10%. That stock's higher in early trading. My theme for this year is the great zombie roll-up, and part of that is winners and losers will adapt. FedEx has always been a winner, John. It's hugely important as a symbol of the logistics of America. America, and this is Fred Smith 
and his new leadership saying, let's go take three units, squeeze it into one to do ever better. They're going to take costs out in that, and they give a nice dividend leap here to somebody who's actually had ample dividend growth over the and years. And accelerating the cost cuts as well, you'd think, Tom. At least this will enable them to do that. A little bit later, we get some data <coughs> in about 30 minutes from now, actually. The ADP report, which we often refer to as the appetizer before the big one, the payrolls report on Friday, as Lisa said repeatedly through this morning, people line up to say you can ignore that and then they end up trading on it <clears throat> anyway. So we'll see what we get a little bit later. Then at 8.30, just another programming note for you, Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed sitting down with Mike McKee after teeing up 5% at staying there through year-end. The communication from the Fed has been pretty clear on this, Tom. Yes, they believe <clears throat> to some extent yes. Yes, yes, the yes, banking yes. issues are a substitute for hikes, but ultimately they don't want to cut and they want to stick with where they are. And they're each different. Like to look from Cleveland to St. Louis, it's not just that the Cardinals and the Indians look pretty good this year. John, these are some real distinctions between Bullard of St. Louis and Mester of Cleveland, but they're pretty much on the same page of what Susan Collins of Boston told Mike McKee. I'm sorry, we're data dependent. Get over it. We need to see the data. The last meeting was too soon to make a call ultimately on how much the tightening right. means for rate hikes. <clears throat> I think they can signal to some extent and say it's a substitute. They can leave the dot plot unchanged and acknowledge they were going to lift yeah, it before, well, but after <clears throat> this, we'll keep it unchanged. So there's something implied in that. But ultimately, Tom, it's too soon. And we've been asking a question May 3rd. Lisa, is May 3rd early enough? And we're told maybe it's too early. Right. It's but too early. The one thing that people keep saying is the Fed is more concerned about not going hard enough and inflation getting out of control than they are of overshooting and seeing a big decline in the economy. And that's I, I, They just need to see the vectors come down. Service sectors ever so slight. Goods clearly shows disinflation. But, uh, you know, they're data dependent. I'm going to cut them some major slack. I think, you know, Lisa, you're, you're more critical about the pacing and the dialogue. And to me, you know, the uncertainty right now is off the chart. I, I mean, it's just it's literally off the chart. The uncertainty in Washington is off the chart as well. We had a huge response to the attendance on Bloomberg surveillance a few days ago of Michael Zeldin to say he's a former federal prosecutor and at American University, Washington College of Law, barely describes his commitment not only to prosecutorial law, but to explaining it on TV. He's one of those people that comes on and is crystal clear. Let's go Law 101 here, sir. We did not see misdemeanors yesterday. All of the headlines today speak of felony. Explain the distinction for the former president of misdemeanor versus felony charges. A misdemeanor is something less serious than a felony. The misdemeanors in this case would have been the mere entry of false data on the books and records of the business. However, they couldn't directly charge that because that has a two-year statute of limitations, and this occurred longer than two years ago. So they had to figure out a way to make those misdemeanor business record false statements into a felony. And what they did was they said that that misdemeanor was undertaken for the purpose of promoting another crime, in this case, hiding from the people of New York the true intent of what Trump was doing, which they allege is to deprive the people of information that would have been relevant to their decision of who to vote for. Specifically, they paid three people, Stormy, Mc, Stormy Daniels, McDougal, and a doorman money to suppress their stories so that the voting public wouldn't know what Trump was up to in this sort of misogynistic way prior to the election. We could, it's an interesting theory. We'll see how it plays out mm, in practice. We, we could talk an hour today, Michael, about this nuance. I'm going to go to what I witnessed yesterday in the silliness of microanalysis by non-pros like you of who held the door for whom. Did you see a normal process yesterday? Does it matter that we're analyzing who's holding the door for a given defendant? Not at all. In fact, uh, for a few minutes, I turned on the television and I heard that comment as well. And I thought, boy, they really are struggling to fill airtime because they expected this arraignment to take place more quickly than it did. That had nothing to do with anything of substance. The only thing that mattered yesterday was that Donald Trump, Donald Trump was charged with 34 felonies. He pleaded not guilty. They set a next court appearance in December and between now and then, There'll be a whole host of motions filed by Trump's lawyers to try to either change the venue of this case and or to 
dismiss it on various legal theories. That's what's going to play out between now and December. But let's go to the media circus, Michael, because as a former federal prosecutor, how much do you have to factor that in to A, what you prosecute, and B, how you prosecute it, given a lot of interest in a given case? Well, you have to be very careful about that. Every individual defendant is entitled to a fair trial, and you don't want to poison the possibility of that through a media circus. Now, I think the prosecutor is going to be very circumspect about how they proceed. I think they're going to try to wait, rein in their witnesses, particularly Michael Cohen, who's an ever-present presence on television, which I find surprising. But I think that the biggest problem is going to be, can Donald Trump follow the admonition of the judge to try to temper his, I guess, commentary on, on the case? And yesterday at Mar-a-Lago, he seemed to have ignored what the judge said uh, on day one. As you see, Michael, how this is playing out in the media and how this is playing out politically with the Republican Party coalescing behind the former president, do you think that this case was a mistake by Alvin Bragg? Well, it depends on what you mean by mistake. If you're thinking, was this a mistake to be the first case, if there are going to be other cases against Donald Trump? Maybe. It's not the strongest case. If you're thinking, what about accountability? Well, the president did all the activities that are charged in this indictment while he was a private citizen, before he was even elected president. And most people in that circumstance would be charged with this crime. When you ask your guests as they come on for future uh, segments th this morning, ask them if they were in their business and they entered falsely these types of records, would they fear being charged? I think the answer would be, of course, nobody would get away with that sort of business crimes in Manhattan. So it's accountability versus political strength of, a, uh, of the media and the courts and the public perception. And I, I think I go with accountability. Well, Michael, what you described, though, was the legal art of turning a misdemeanor into a felony from a DA that likes to turn felonies into misdemeanors. So, yeah. Michael, is that not somewhat concerning to you? Well, you know, I, I got a, a, a direct message from a friend of mine yesterday saying, she wished that he would be as tough on other types of crimes as he appears to be on Donald Trump and this type of crime. And I guess the point is fair enough, but it seems to me that if you believe that what the president did or the candidate did in order to win the presidency was a crime, then you bring that crime and you bring it for all it's worth, which is the felony charges. Michael, thanks for being with us today. Thoughtful stuff, as sure. always. Michael's out in there of the American University, Washington <clears throat> College of Law, Tom. I, I just love talking to prosecutors. I, 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 and, and a number of the other networks had some brilliant people on yesterday. And you, you get a concision of thought there, John. And, you know, I feel like someone watching Perry Mason when I was 12 years old and my mother would explain why Della Reese was... You know, that you know, I, I'm a complete amateur. I'm complete. Lisa's way better at this than I am. Oh, I think a lot of people have you pretended know. to be lawyers in the last couple yeah, of days. Yes, I mean, thank I'm just you. sitting here ask, asking questions, Lisa. I'm confused by it. It doesn't make sense <clears throat> to me. I am totally on the same page as everyone who thinks that everyone should be treated the same as everybody, without a doubt. And, and you know the way I feel about the way senators and people in the office and American political institutions are treated in this country. I think they get far, far too much deference from the general public and the media, et cetera. We've covered all of that. But when it comes to this, Lisa, this doesn't feel like it's consistent based on this DA's approach to crime in New York. He hasn't <clears> been particularly harsh with other types of crime, and he's come under criticism for that. This really goes to the heart of prosecutorial discretion, which is an art, not a science, and definitely is something people usually aren't as deep in. Well said, Bramo, as always. Equity Futures down a tenth on the S&P. Joe Quinlan of the Merrill and Bank of America Good. Private Bank is going to be joining us shortly in your bond market, 333. And I just got sight of Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed. Just out the corner of my eye, Tom. She's going to be with us in about 30 minutes' time. The slowing inflation scenario that you have in the U.S. gives the central bank the opportunity to slow their rate hikes. The Fed's hands are now tied. They're in a difficult situation. The market's looking for cuts, but we still have inflation that is not fully behind us. The markets are not believing what the Fed is saying. Just like they were in unprecedented waters in not hiking in 21, 
they're really in unprecedented waters for not easing right now. So it's really critical for the Fed and other central banks to be viewed as vigilant around inflation. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramitz, and Tom Keen on television, on radio, with markets on the move. Moments ago, John Farrell, that thing we've been looking at, the two-year yield, it plunges down to a 3.80 handle. This is an abrupt move. A little bit fast and loose with the word plunge, Tom, but I'll go with you. We're down about two basis points now on a two-year after being high by about five basis points. Lisa can't keep it together. <laughs> that was so I mean, gracefully you know, done. I, I just, Plunged. Anyway, anyway, carry on. I'll carry on. The data's been soft for the week so far whether you look at the ISM for the manufacturing, factory orders, job openings, and that's been driving yields much lower. Right. It started the week at 4.1%. Tom, right now, we're at 381 on a percentage basis, this is the way Stan Fisher, the former vice chairman of the Fed, would look at it. On a, on a basis of back to that 4.1% level, John, it's a 9% move in yield that we've seen from 4.1 down to a 3.80. I take your point that we still have not broken through support. The volatility right now is so great. Are you ready for this? I need to see like a 3.55 to begin to get stressful. That's how bad the volatility overlay is on this bond market. So let's work through the data, Tom. The ADP report in about 12 minutes' time, 13 minutes' time. Then it's on to the ISM services read a little bit later. Then it's on to claims and all that good stuff. <clears throat> yeah. Over to payrolls on Friday. Then CPI on the 12th. Wages. I guess I got to go to wage growth. You know, somebody in Europe today, I'm sorry, I can't remember, folks, was talking about the wage spiral in Europe. Maybe we get wage indication that dovetails into what Mike McKee looks like, which is that service sector measurement of inflation. I mean, that's the only way I can link this in together. Whatever it says, you can sit here and <clears throat> say, well, things have changed. We've got that banking stress. It's going to lead to tighter lending standards, which will ultimately mean will lead to softer growth. That's going to be the pushback we get on Friday, be the pushback right. we get next week when we get the CPR report. Bloomberg with a CNBS article out moments ago here, really talking about the issuance within the real estate market has come to complete halt. And Lisa, that's really the story here, dovetailing your bond market expertise into the greater economy. There's a post-banking crisis tension right now. Especially because it's not just because of weakness in the <clears throat> banks. It's because of the flow of money into money market accounts, as we've been talking about. And how is that going to strain lending in all sorts of corners, just to build on what you guys were talking about with wages, what you have seen is a softening in wages as well in the U.S. At least if you look at, for example, the wage growth uh, tracker that the Atlanta Fed has, you could see that job switchers aren't getting as big a pop in their wages. But is that enough? And I think that that's what people are looking for. Is that enough at a time when you still have inflation running too hot and you still have kind of stagflationary ingredients, Tom, that are making people uneasy? Well, maybe well, the stagflation's there, but again, I just think it's gross uncertainty. John, the one thing I'm going to look at is a 10-year real yield. Let's call it a grind. It's not a plunge, but it's grinding ever lower. I don't think the street is set up for an inflation-adjusted yield that reverts back from that healing good news that Jerome Powell wanted. The markets made a call, disinflationary bust. <laughs> We'll get some data on Friday, some data next week. I think it's far too early yeah. for the Fed to sit there in early May and make the call that they know what's going to happen here. It's June too early. It's July. It's August. For how long, Lisa, are we going to ignore the incoming information? Well, you say it's a disinflationary bust. The bond market's saying that. But stocks aren't saying that True. quite yet. And they're starting to wake up to that. So at some point, that might actually force the hand of the Federal Reserve. OPEC Plus out of the news today. Let me start the data check, John. Brent crude, 86 level, down to an 84.87. Equity futures a bit softer here, Tom. We're only down a tenth of 1%. <clears throat> Yields basically unchanged now on a 10-year. Yields were higher going into the ADP report. Now they're basically unchanged on a 10-year. The ADP report, Tom, about 11 minutes away. The ADP report, as Lisa has said repeatedly through today, that no one cares about until they do. And they often care about it a second after 8.15. <laughs> yeah, I, I care about it. I care about it because they handle the paychecks of America. I think the new study they have is a little more granular and a little more authentic about what are those actual, in the old days, pieces of paper actually doing. Let's jump to it with Joe Quinlan here. Joseph Quinlan with decades of experience in the ups and downs of the market, head of, of CIO market strategy at Merrill and Bank of America Private Bank. Joe, I got to go to the news on FedEx today. You and I have seen this before, going back to Textron and Tenneco and Link Temco vote, if you will. We're one company, so let's split up into three. And then 10 years later, we're three companies. Let's combine back into one to keep everybody busy. Are we going to see more companies adapting 
to the post-pandemic world by strategic changes simply to reduce expenses? I think they have to, Tom, given the fact that you're looking at more protectionism from the United States, Europe, of course, China, U.S. tensions as well. So companies are rethinking how they're operating, not just in North America, but Europe and Asia. And these redundancies are going to be built into the supply chain. We know that. So the key to what we, what we don't know, how costly is this going to be? How long is it going to take? And where do the productivity gains come in? And that productivity gains right. come later. Your hallmark is I got to part. As I think of Gina Martin Adams at, at Bloomberg Intelligence, same thing. You got to be in the market. You got to participate. Joe, I'm scared stiff. How do I participate right now? Well, Tom, you can be scared, but participate. Stay in the market. That's what we're telling our clients. Really, you know, when you're building a core portfolio, have you want to own companies in sectors that are growing, right? They're ac actually expanding secularly, cyclically. So look at defense. Healthcare, we still like energy. So there's places to put money to work in the market, in equities, and you can still sleep at night and you can work your way through this chop and churn in the market. So that's what you have to do. You have to be in the market, though. You have to be in high quality, big companies where there's growth in these underlying sectors. A lot of people are talking about the growing divergence between bonds and stocks, with bonds calling for this disinflationary bust that forces the Fed's hand uh, and forces them to cut, and stocks saying things are just fine, things are going to keep grinding along, and good news uh, is good news, and bad news can also be good news. We are shifting here, and we are seeing a bit of an awakening in certain stocks to a potential disinflationary bust. Do you think that synergy between bonds and stocks will continue with stocks coming to the bond uh, side? Well, at least it's a great question. We're going to know very shortly with the earnings season. So that, that's going to be very important, how companies come to the markets, tell us what happened, what's going to happen, how they're pricing, how their their expectations. So, yeah, the, the equities seem to have a mind of their own, but the earnings reset to bring it back down to earth, so to speak, and have more bonds and equities to think. This is what Mike Wilson is talking about over at Morgan Stanley, and a lot of people are saying as well. But they said this in December as well, and then we got an earnings season that wasn't that great. People seem to gloss over that. Why was it not enough then to cause a sell-off, but it will be enough this earnings season? Because, Lisa, because when you look at overall earnings per share for this year, they're still too high. They've got to come down. Savita, my colleague at Bank of America, she's at $200 this year. I think the consensus is so we're, you know, begrudgingly, we have to bring down the earnings estimates to 23, which then helps sets us up for 24. And I do think the markets are going to start pricing in better news for 24. But we're not there yet. I look, Joe, it, we're not there yet. Well, as John Farrow just mentioned, we've got X number of Fed meetings to move away from uncertainty to find clarity. Where's the Quinlan clarity meter? Is it in the summer or do we need to go to the autumn to find Joe Quinlan like brilliance? I don't know if that's ever going to come, Tom, but I think it's more, we got to move through the second quarter. We got to see what the earnings outlook looks like. And then we really need that confirmation whether wages you just talked about, are they actually coming down? Is inflation tracking lower than PCE? So, we're still a couple of months out in terms of really getting some hard data points that suggest the Fed is correct on the right path, and there's no hiccups coming down the pipe. Well, there'll always be hiccups, but nothing out of the blue that strikes. So we're not there yet, but I think by summer we'll have clarity heading into 24, and that's going to be key for the market. Joe, Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley said this earlier this week, that he sees little evidence that a new bull market has begun and believe the bear market still has unfinished business. What evidence would you see? when a bull market starts? Where would you look for it? Well, John, I would look for the, the actual whites of the eyes of the recession, right? When the recession starts, typically, that's when the earnings, that's when the markets bottom out and then we begin again. We'll see the stocks move before the economy. So you know, we're, we're kind of, we're looking, tracking for growth first quarter, you know, the real GDP, say one seven. If you could tell me that Q2, Q3, we're going to be much weaker, negative territory, I would become more bullish looking in and beyond six, 12 months out for equity. OK, Joe, thanks for that. Appreciate the clarity. Joe Quinlan there of Maryland Bank of America, private bank. On the latest, it's so weird still, Lisa, to see Mike Wilson and Marka Kalanovic. Mike Wilson and Marka Kalanovic on the same page, isn't it? I would agree. It's so strange. Which makes both people basically get lumped into the same category of people saying, eh, they're always a bear or they're always a bull or they're always just extreme. I honestly I think, though, it does indicate a consolidation of views around this sort of bearish tilt. Much of last year, Lisa, you yeah. get that note from Mike Wilson on a Sunday. 
and then you'd wait sort of Monday, Tuesday time, and you'd be like, OK, let's get the bullish side of things from Marco over at JP Morgan and Tom. That's changed. They're both on the same page. It's... Marco this week said, we expect I... a reversal in risk sentiment and the market retesting last year's low over the coming months. Lisa did surrogate Pharaoh here when you were out, John, with the plague, and Lisa featured Marco's work. No one cuts strategists slack like I do, because let me tell you, you can count the times. If ever, if ever someone says, Tom, you're so smart, you just go, Tom, Brazil. <laughs> I got Brazil. I got Lula. So wrong. So I'm going to cut these people some slack. We're out of a pandemic. We haven't even had time for it today. Richard Clarido with a brilliant essay in The Economist. And he says, look, it's all about an original supply side shock that Marco and Mike and Joe Quinlan are still dealing with. I mean, it's all there is Can to it. Can I just it. say this, though? I'll cut them some slack, too. It's a very, very difficult job to do. I struggle to cut slack for shops and houses that get it wrong and then don't offer you any clarity or transparency oh, yeah, absolutely. into what went wrong. Exactly. Oh, that's, no, that's, totally that's agree. That's what I struggle with. And, and, yeah, I mean, I don't mean to interrupt here, but, John, you're just hugely, hugely correct. And the major the major thing is you, you got to learn from when you're wrong. I mean, you know. Well, and explain the reasoning that led to it and how your reasoning has yeah. either shifted or uh, doubled down. I'll just say we got that from, from one bank and maybe not the other. Just going to leave that there. Cleveland Fed President Loretta <laughs> Mester is going to join us in 18 minutes' time. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Donald Trump has denounced his indictment in New York as politically motivated, and he tried to link the case to grievances he has long deployed to hold sway over his supporters. The former president spoke at his estate in Florida hours after he pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records. Taiwan calls President Tsai Ing-wen's meeting with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in the U.S. a rare opportunity. It may also lead to renewed military tension around the island. Tsai meets with McCarthy and other members of Congress today at the Reagan Library in Los Angeles. China has threatened an unspecified response. Voters in Chicago have elected progressive Brandon Johnson to be their next mayor. In a runoff, the Cook County Commissioner defeated Paul Vallis, a former head of Chicago Public Schools, who made crime the focus of his campaign. Both are Democrats. Johnson wants to raise taxes on major corporations to boost Chicago's revenue. Mortgage rates in the U.S. fell for a fourth straight week. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association, the contract rate for a 30-year fixed mortgage declined five basis points to 6.4 percent. Now, that's the lowest in seven weeks. Still, an index of mortgage applications to buy a house decreased 3.5 percent. And FedEx is consolidating its operating companies into one organization to save money. The package shipper estimates that combining FedEx Express, FedEx Ground, FedEx Services, and other FedEx companies can save $4 billion. It's also raising its dividend by 10 percent. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Lisa with the line of the morning a couple of hours ago. We don't care about the ADP report until we do. Now we do. <laughs> now we do. Downside surprise. Mike McKee, what have you got? 145,000 is the number of jobs that ADP counted during the month of March, significantly below the forecast for 210,000. And the last month's number, which originally printed at 242, now they've revised that up to 261. Remember, with the uh, payrolls number uh, for the month last uh, month we came in at 311. <clears throat> Does it have any predictive power? Not a whole lot, but as one analyst put it this morning, guys, uh, it's a jumping off point from uh, here to the payrolls numbers. People go back and look at all of their data. I think the ISM employment numbers for services are going to be more important at 10 o'clock this morning. But a quick look at the numbers here, uh, and it, it's interesting, construction jobs, according to ADP, up 53,000. Remember, construction was dead and housing was dead and all that. But uh, they <clears throat> record a lot of lost jobs, 30,000 in manufacturing, yeah. which is uh, 
we've been waiting for that, and we did get a, a negative print uh, from the ISM manufacturing numbers. The construction lift is all working on John's remodeling of his kitchen. <laughs> They're all in there. That could, that could be. Oh, that that story was yeah. Leisure and hospitality up 98,000, which would be interesting to see again okay. on uh, Friday, whether we're can, still can I ask a, adding that a, many. Can I interrupt and ask a question here, which I think is really important Just for Wall Street? John, anyway. John, yeah, thank you. But, John, you're expert on this. The two-year yield cratered 20 minutes ago, and now we're down even further, a stunning 3.78%. Did ADP leak? Did I've got no information on, on that yet? whatsoever. I don't, I don't think it necessarily did, but you've got so many cross currents in the yeah, markets okay. these days. I'm just I mean, bringing it up. Ask him for a friend. I, I <laughs> wasn't here with you. <clears throat> what would I know? I wasn't as down about the uh, jolts data yesterday as the markets were. I mean, well, I'm I old enough surprised. to remember when that was the number we wanted. <clears throat> from yeah. jolts to get the feds back away. I just want to pick up on the price action briefly. Mm. Two-year yield was higher this morning by almost seven basis points. It's now lower by five or six basis points on a two-year. So that's a turnaround off the back of this downside surprise. In the equity market on the S&P 500, just a little bit lower. No drama here, down about a tenth of 1%. But Lisa, clearly the story here is weak mm. data, or at least downside <laughs> surprise after downside surprise through much of this week, pushing through to a lower two-year yield on the we week so far. Which goes to this question that Mike just sort of implicitly brought up, which is, is the market trading off a conviction, a narrative that they use the data to try to justify, and they pick the weaker aspects of it and not the stronger ones? Because, yes, this is a number that most people would shrug off in any other time, but we are seeing to your yields slightly softer on yesterday's jolts data. On one hand, yes, the headline number coming to the weakest going back almost two years. But the number of quits going up. That, that, that was what really got to be. I mean, the data's old, but the Americans were still confident in their job prospects. And here's a bit of data out of the ADP. Uh, they now do the uh, jobs, uh, they do pay numbers for jobs. And uh, job switchers saw a 14.2% increase in their incomes. Uh, in the month of March, uh, that's a, an, a, on an annualized basis. Job stayers, 6.9%. So ADP still finds wage pressures out there. I think we've got to remember the nature of the market we're in right now. And Mike, I think you can speak to this. This data is about getting an understanding of the condition of the economy going into the banking stress. And for that matter, I think a lot of people are willing to <clears throat> ignore any sign of resilience and embrace signs of weakness, because that's ultimately where the bias is at the moment. They believe that's where we're going. Yeah. Well, that's why it'll be interesting to see what happens on Friday with the jobs numbers. If the jobs numbers are strong, oh. does that cause a Wall Street rethink? It's not going to cause a Fed rethink, and I will bet you uh, right now I'll do a Karnak the Magnificent forecast on an answer we're going to get. Mike, <laughs> Tom will explain that to you. Uh, John but, Carson about 12, 10 midnight, yeah. I would say. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> if I ask her, you know, have you made up your mind? I'm sure she's going to say we're waiting for the data. And it was uh, like Jim Bullard told me on Monday. Right. He said, we don't have to make a decision till May 3rd, so why would we, given all the data that's still out there? The insight, Mike, I've had in this hugely uncertain blur, and your great work, may I say, with the Federal Reserve of Boston, of St. Louis, a Cardinals game you went to. Was, I actually was watching the Cardinals, looking behind home plate to see if you, could to see. See if you were I don't get paid seats. enough. You're the only one that can sit in those seats. And now Cleveland, but you're really working, working, working these smart people on what they're doing. And to me, what time stood still was David Kelly over at J.P. Morgan saying we are going to see negative non-farm payrolls. How does Loretta Mester's world change if we get one, two, dare I say three months in a row of negative non-farm payrolls somewhere out there? Well, I... I, I don't see that happening, in the, at least in the short term. But if it did happen, then we would definitely be having the conversation about rate cuts. Because if you were seeing uh, jobs lost on a significantly sequential basis, it would tell you the economy is in recession. What John was just talking about, and this is, I think, is really important, that people believe that the data is all backward looking that we're getting now. And that it sets the stage for where we're heading because of tighter lending conditions. Is that how Fed officials look at it? Are they going to speak to that in not only the meeting, but when you talk to Loretta Mester in just well, a couple of minutes? Yeah, they know that uh, the data are the rearview mirror, essentially. They're looking at all kinds of data. There are more timely private sector data sets that they're looking at these days and that the government is using. They have incorporated some of those into uh, the BEA and BLS uh, numbers that come out. But... Uh, 
they know they, they're looking backwards, so they have to extrapolate forward. Uh, the big uh, number, the ISM services, uh, core services, X housing, um, that's in the, uh, the conference board's index of lagging indicators. So while that is an important number for them, it is not something that is particularly timely, timely at the moment. We've got to get to the balance of risk question, Mike. There's been a belief for much of the last year that the risk of doing too little outweighed the risk of doing too much. Given the nature of the shock in the last month, does the risk of doing too much now outweigh the risk of doing too little? Well, that's a good question uh, for President Mester that uh, I can put to her. I think that they would have told you uh, last, at the last Fed meeting, Jay Powell would have said that the balance of risks is uh, very finely balanced at this point. We don't know and they don't know whether we're going to see a significant tightening in credit because it had already <laughs> happened. The last senior loan officer survey out in January showed 43% of the banks had tightened their credit standards. So do they need to go much further, or was this really about a couple of banks that had management problems? If we're in the moment of we don't know, for every single meeting of the last year, that meant hike. Now, does it mean pause? That's what I'm trying to work out. They're in the risk <coughs> management business. If you don't know, is the prudent course of action in May, on May 3rd, if you don't have sufficient information to pause, to wait. Yeah, that's kind of the decision they're up to now. Um, Jim Bullard wants to go all the way up to close to 6%, but most of the others are in the 5.1% cap. That's the median, which would be one more move. And their modeling has told them that that is probably where they need to be. You look at the statistics, and the Fed has always raised the uh, Fed funds rate above the level of inflation. Uh, when we've had a situation where they're trying to bring inflation down, and they've just gotten even with it now, basically, if you're looking at the PCE numbers. So one more move would make them more restrictive, and they probably at that point will start thinking about the idea of a pause. It's just not simple anymore, though, Mike, because Fed funds alone doesn't tell you about how tight things are, because now it's Fed funds plus banking stress which was clearly the direction of travel at the last Fed meeting. Yeah, it's something you have to add into the discussion because the Fed is also looking at the cumulative effect of all of the rate increases that they've done. You don't buy a car every day. You don't buy a house every day. Companies don't decide to invest in a plant or, or additional software every day. So it takes time for all those decisions to be made and play into the economy. So sometime starting in the second half of this year, the feeling is we're going to see all of that hit. And if we see tightening credit conditions on top of that, it even makes it more difficult to see strength in the economy going forward. That's the argument of the people who see recession ahead. Mike, you know how I feel about your interviews with the Federal Reserve? Just second to none. Fantastic. <clears throat> Looking forward to this conversation in about five minutes' time. Michael McKee sitting down with the Cleveland Fed President, Loretta Mester. Lisa, you're going to love this quote. It comes from Connor Sen of Bloomberg Opinion. The economy is guilty until proven innocent in the eyes of fixed income investors at the moment. Doesn't that capture things? Things. Absolutely. They see this economy as rapidly slowing and decelerating. My question is, we keep talking about the Fed being more concerned about inflation. When do they start getting more concerned about the fact that unemployment can take on a life of its own? Payrolls coming up on Friday, coming up on the open in the next hour on Bloomberg TV. Matt Miskin of John Hancock Investment Management, Andrew Sliman of Morgan Stanley, Meredith Watson of BlackRock from New York. It's good to be back. This is Bloomberg. Surveillance Lisa Bramitz and Tom King, John Farrell preparing for the next hour of festivities here. And it is markets on the move off ADP data. They moved earlier and then moved ever more so on a weaker statistic. And Lisa, a two year yield from a 4.10 blowing through the recent support. And technically, it's 3.76, 3.76% on the two year yield. I would suggest in the recent weeks and months, this is new territory. It is right now. The lowest uh, if it were to close here since September of 2022. It raises this question, what is the bond market that other asset classes haven't woken up to yet and the Fed officials themselves haven't necessarily seen? Everyone will get out their Newtonian calculus today to look at that two-year yield. They'll go to logs. So Michael McKee and I really, well, we really don't do that. Bramo doesn't really do that. But someone that can go to logs and look at the rates of change of our economy is Loretta Mester of the Cleveland 
Fed. She is definitive in mathematics out of Columbia and Princeton and joins our Michael McKee here at our world headquarters. Michael? Uh, thank you very much, Tom, and we'd like to welcome Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester to our uh, viewers and listeners worldwide here on Bloomberg. Uh, Tom said you're the math expert. You, <laughs> you look at the ADP numbers, we might as well start with that because right. it's just out 145,000. Right. I know there's questions about their methodology or what it means, but right. what do you take away from it? Well, we have to look at all the data. So that's a data point that we're going to look at. We're going to get the employment report on Friday. So there's just a lot of data coming in. And we're going to use that to assess not only where the economy has been, but where it's going. Because as you know, it's about where the economy is going that's really important for our setting monetary policy. Well, that was one of the questions that they were just asking me in uh, uh, the surveillance uh, studio. How do you know what you're looking for when the data are in the rearview mirror? Well, you know, the data in the rearview mirror is important because it tells you something about where the economy is going. So you don't throw that data away, but you also have to do a lot of other kind of reconnaissance. So, you know, the nice thing about having Federal Reserve Banks across the country is that we can talk to um, contacts in our districts, you know, whether it be labor market um, contacts or business contacts, to really find out what's happening on the ground at the moment. And that information, anecdotal information, is very helpful as well. And then we do surveys and other kinds of more timely information. So all of that goes into sort of formulating monetary policy. So I think it's wrong to think like, oh, we're looking only in the rearview mirror at data that's from a month ago or two months ago. That data is actually helpful for looking at trends. And then we also uh, augment that with other data about what's really happening on the ground, on Main Street, for businesses that have to cope with this economy. Well, what's happening on Main Street? Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it kind of two parts. In general, what are you hearing? Mm -hmm. And then what are you hearing from bankers in your district about uh, credit quality? All right. So credit quality is still fine. Um, bankers are telling us that that isn't really a, a problem. It might have ticked up a, a tad. But it certainly is still low, very low by historical standards. So that isn't a, a focus now. Um, the bankers have, you know, struggled with retaining deposits during the March um, tensions in the banking industry. But that has stabilized since then. In terms of credit, in terms of credit um, standards, you know, they had already been tightening credit standards as interest rates went up. So they're continuing to do that. They're continuing to monitor. Um, you know, their, their customers are continuing to monitor going forward in terms of making sure that they're well positioned for the economy with higher interest rates. In terms of the businesses themselves, of course, they are preparing, right, for, I would say, some slowdown in the economy. But a lot of the firms are still telling us that their conditions are still pretty good. They're worried about the economy in general, and so they're being a little defensive now. Um, some pullback in some of their investment spending. But again, it doesn't feel like everyone thinks that we're going to have a deep recession. It's just they're trying to be more cautious so that they're well prepared for whatever happens in the economy in the future. Well, the recession argument that a lot of people are making sort of depends on the idea that the full weight of all of the cumulative weight of your rate increases hasn't hit the economy yet. Plus, we throw in the banking, maybe tightening credit standards a little more. Uh, are you worried about the second half of the year? Well, I do think that growth this year is going to be well below trend. And you're right, the banking tensions certainly, typically when you see that happening, you do see banks pull back. Um, on their credit standards and tightening, tight their, tighten their credit standards. We don't know right now either the duration of those effects from what happened in March or how strong those effects will be. So we do expect that to happen, but we're, right now we're in that time where we're assessing, talking to the bankers, looking at things like the SLUS, which is the uh, Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey, to get a really good sense of where bankers are. As I said, even before the March tensions in the industry, banking industry, you know, the banks were pulling back and tightening credit standards. And that's kind of normal. That's the normal flow of monetary policy tightening throughout the economy. That's one of the ways it gets 
pushed out into the economy. So, so that's fine. That's kind of what we are intending in terms of making sure that we can slow down demand so that we get a better balance between demand and supply and, and reduce those price pressures. And now we're assessing whether the tensions in the banking industry have augmented that. And that's part of what the evaluation will be as we go in to the next FOMC meeting in terms of calibrating monetary policy. Well, you're in New York. Uh, the, all the big trading desks are only a few blocks away from us. And they're calibrating recession right now and that you're going to be cutting rates not once, two or three times, but four times by next January. Uh, how do you process that view versus yours? Well, you know, we've seen periods where the markets have one view of what's going to happen in the economy and the Fed has another view. And, you know, we tr certainly take information from that. You know, we, we see what they're doing and we're saying, okay, that's their view of what's happening. We have our own forecasts. We just put out forecasts at the last FOMC meeting. Um, and if you look at those, we did say that growth this year was going to be very much below um, trend growth. And so I think we see things a little bit differently in terms of what the appropriate monetary policy is given where the economy is and where it's going. We certainly are focused on inflation and making sure that inflation gets back down to 2% over time. Well, is the idea of four rate cuts in the next year crazy? Well, it certainly isn't my policy path. I mean, I think we're going to have to go a little bit higher from, from where we are, um, a little bit more, and then hold there for some time in order to make sure that inflation is on that sustainable downward path to 2%. That doesn't mean we're going to continue to raise rates until inflation gets back to 2%. We're going to be sort of calibrating in order to see that inflation is going to move down. And my own forecast is that it will take some time to get inflation back down. But I, you know, I think we're going to make some appreciable um, progress this year and then continue to make progress next year and then hit 2% in 2025. What's your trajectory for inflation? Uh, where can we end the year and how fast would we get there? Yeah, so I'm about three and three quarters percent um, by the end of this year. Continued progress next year, maybe two and three quarters and then two percent in 2025. And I think that's a good progress. Um, but you got to remember, we've been at high inflation well over two percent for quite some time. And that's why it's imperative that we continue to make progress and that we continue on this path. Now, we're going to be judicious about it. We're not going to, you know, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. We're going to make sure that we're making good judgments along the way. But it is kind of crucial that we get inflation back down in a timely way to 2%. Well, you're talking about not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but the old adage is the Fed tightens until something breaks. What would you say the balance of risks is now between something breaking on the growth side and unemployment side and inflation? Yeah. Well, I'm hoping we don't tighten until th something breaks. I don't think that's the, the strategy that I would like to follow. I think we've got to be judicious about it and try to calibrate our policy in the, cor in the correct way. I mean, we've made a lot of progress in terms of where we started when we started raising rates. We were at zero, right? And we've come a long way. So we're making progress on getting to where we need to get to. And my own view is that we're going to have to go a little bit further, but we're certainly well on the way of where we need to get to. And then we hold for a while. And yes, we can recalibrate our policy if the economy evolves differently than we're anticipating. And that's the, the nature of monetary policy making. You want to be able to take all the information in, set a policy path that is consistent with getting back to full employment, maximum employment, and price stability. And then if the economy evolves differently than you anticipate, then you might have to adjust your policy path. And you need to be open to that. And especially in a, in a situation like this where there is high uncertainty. There were high, high uncertainty in the economy before we had the tensions in the banking system. That tension in the banking system, the stresses in, the bank, in, those, in those banks has added more uncertainty. And so you've got to be willing to sort of take in more information, look at it, and reassess if, if need be in terms of where policy needs to get to. Well, you said we should do a little more. Uh, the consensus median dot was 5.1, which would be one more rate move. Right. Uh, are you in the group that was above that? Yeah. How far do you think we well, need to go? Well, I see a little more um, inflation pressures than the median in the um, SEP from the December SEP. So I probably am a little bit higher than 
the median dot. But again, I'm open to making sure that we're setting policy to get inflation back down to 2%. So I'm open in terms of let's take in what the economy is telling us about where it's going. Let's make sure that we get inflation on that sustainable downward path. So I'm not, you know, we've made a lot of progress and I'm willing to sort of let's take it in and look at where the economy is going. Well, My own view is that we'll have to go above 5%. But exactly how much, precisely how much, and precisely how long it has to stay above, we've got to be open to allowing the economy to tell us. Is a uh, rate increase on May 3rd a certainty basically locked in at this point? Too soon. Um, I heard the promo before. You're right. I'm going to tell you that we have a lot more data to get to. And um, we'll see as we get there what, what's happening in the economy. Again, the economy is going to tell us where it wants us to get to. Well, Loretta Mester says, I'm right. And so that's a great place to stop the interview. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today here in New York. And we'll look on May 3rd to see if I'm still right. <laughs> I'll send it back to you. Now, Michael McKee, thank you so much. We are here in our studios looking at markets on the move off that ADP report, maybe even off what we heard from Dr. Mester uh, as well. My major takeaway there, I heard elements of Draghi. Is Loretta Mester confidently looked out to 2025, a longer timeline than maybe what we would see from many. Futures negative eight. We're watching the bond market. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. From a New York courtroom to the campaign stage in Florida, Donald Trump has put his comeback bid for the White House back in the forefront. After pleading not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records in Manhattan, the former president spoke to a crowd of supporters at his Mar-a-Lago resort in Palm Beach, where he called the indictment politically motivated. In Wisconsin, Democrats have won a majority on the Supreme Court for the first time in 15 years. And it comes as justices will consider a case that could determine access to abortion. Now, the two candidates in the Wisconsin race spent $28 million, making it the most expensive state Supreme Court case in U.S. history. In Italy, former Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi has been hospitalized in intensive care. Berlusconi is 86. He was described as being in stable condition. Before turning to politics, Berlusconi built a media empire. He served four times as prime minister. Walmart is betting on warehouse robots. The retail giant says that within three years, the cost of moving goods will fall 20 percent, thanks to warehouse robots playing a larger role in getting goods to customers faster. Walmart also hints that an investment binge may lift profit beyond its long-term goals. And UBS chairman Colm Kelleher says that the integration of Credit Suisse will take three to four years. And that doesn't include the wind down of the investment bank. Kelleher is speaking today at UBS's annual general meeting. He says that even with protection in the form of Swiss government support, there's amount of risk in that deal. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. In terms of the businesses themselves, of course, they are preparing, right, for, I would say, some slowdown in the economy. But a lot of the firms are still telling us that their conditions are still pretty good. The president of the Cleveland Fed, with wonderful concision there, I really can't say the joy I have when I listen to Loretta Mester of uh, uh, Columbia, Bart of a, long, uh, a Barnard of a long time ago. Uh, and Princeton as well in mathematics, just a huge clarity there. And Lisa, before we get to our esteemed guest here following on from Mike McKee's conversation, uh, Claudia Sam, stay with us, folks, on radio and television. Claudia Sam will be with us in a moment. There was a Draghi-esque moment there where she extended out her timeline, I think somewhat courageously, to 2025. Same. I mean, it was on the edge of Mario. It's going to take a long time to get inflation down. That was the takeaway yeah. from her. Still seeing uh, plenty of dynamism in the U.S. economy. 
saying to Michael McKee, the market has its view. We have ours. They are different. We are sticking with ours for now. That is the tension really setting up the market, Tom. It'll be interesting to see. One of the great joys of speaking with Claudia Sam, yes, a former Fed economist and Sam Consulting and writing for Bloomberg Opinion and always controversial. I got eight ways to go here, folks. And I'm going to go to the Sam you don't know, which is she voraciously reads top flight Fed research. Claudia Sam, you go to San Francisco and Adam Shapiro, and you say his mix of what is driving this inflation is something we need to focus on. And that is the part of inflation off of the pandemic that is supply driven or supply side. Explain that. I think a big mistake that we're making at this point is acting like we can use past relationships in the economy to tell us what to do. Right. The pandemic was extremely disruptive, and we see that across many of our peer countries. Set aside monetary policy, <clears throat> set aside fiscal policy, and I'm concerned as time passes that that gets pushed to the side, and that's why I go to Adam Shapiro's research. I think he is one of many who is carefully trying to figure yeah. out that supply, that demand. The theme that I'm seeing into the IMF and World Bank meetings in my conversation, Claudia, tomorrow with uh, Dr. Gorgieva at the IMF is that the analysis now, like I've never seen, is linking monetary policy with our fiscal debt and our fiscal dynamics as well. Can we meld together monetary and fiscal analysis, whether we agree or agree to disagree? There are definitely some connections. I, I'm not sure the ones that we're making in terms of financing the fiscal debt. I mean, that's, that is a direct effect of these interest rates going up so quickly. I have pushed for, and I think you're seeing some signs of it, particularly in Europe, understanding we cannot let the Fed go it alone on inflation. The tools they use are going to cause a lot of pain. And there are things that fiscal authorities can do. It's just we don't have a lot of practice at that. Claudia, have you been surprised by how resilient the economic data has been up until this point? I've been very thankful. I mean, the the Fed is trying to get a slow path back to inflation down. So no recession, no severe recession. That's where markets disagree with them. And the only way the Fed gets that done with the kind of rate increases they've had is if the consumers keep coming back. Right. And if the jobs remain there, even if it slows down, like we are starting from a position of strength that has never been the case going into one of these cycles. How high should the bar be, Claudia, for the Fed to cut rates, given that they still do have the issue of inflation very much front and center? I again, we have this disagreement about what kind of recession, if any, we're faced. I think if we go into a severe recession and the Fed holds on to this, we must stay the course no matter what, that would be a big mistake. Uh, but I, you know, but I take them at their word. I really do. They are going to keep at this until inflation is moving down two percent, whether I agree with that or not. Tell me about the speeds that we're, we're, we're with right now. Gita Gopinath at the IMF talks about this. About I think it's like a general policy, English, if you will, for Newtonian calculus. The rates of change right now, including the huge surge we saw in interest rates, has to be front and center. What are those speeds right now that we're seeing in interest rates as it folds into Fed policy? I, this is one uh, contention I have with how the Fed thinks about the interest rates. They're very focused on the level, like getting the inflation-adjusted yeah. uh, Fed funds well rate said. above. above the, and it's like, <clears throat> come on. Like, you raised interest rates so quickly. We know interest rate risk is there that if we don't learn any lesson from Silicon Valley Bank in terms of the interest rate risk and monetary policy, that is an absolutely missed opportunity. And as... Uh, Loretta Mester was saying, we see the effects in the standards, the lending standards. It is there. It's coming. The last place it shows up is inflation. Right. We know it's in train. I want to cite this carefully off of Gopinath's work. We'll be talking with Gita Gopinath here uh, next week at the IMF. Gita Gopinath talking about the speed effects that are out there. What would be the effect, Dr. Sam, of lower rates or a pause, dare I say? How about pause, pause, pause? Would our world fall apart? No. I, I think it would give the world a chance to catch up. 
with what the Fed has been doing. Uh, Jay Powell has been very clear. We are, have started a, dis, a disinflationary <clears throat> cycle. We know it's coming in housing, but that just is a lag. Just let everybody catch up. This is a speed issue. The Fed went really fast. There is an argument for it. Just let it work, right? Have some faith in what you've done so far. I, at least and, I, and that's why pushing harder, it could go to a very bad place. Lisa, I can't say how controversial the tone is there from Dr. Sam within <laughs> economics now. She is just saying there's a school of thought. Is, would everyone just calm down, stop listening and watching Bloomberg surveillance and just slow down and breathe? That's out there. And analyze what exactly has happened to change the labor market really kind of fundamentally since the pandemic. Claudia, can you make sense of this? There was a recent study that came out that showed Americans are spending substantially less time working than they were pre-pandemic, about, about a half an hour, which doesn't sound like a lot. But this is adding to the constraints in the labor market. How much is the Fed taking into consideration some pretty profound structural changes when they look to what they need to see with respect to unemployment rates as well as wages? So not enough. But this is not a criticism of the Fed. Again, we are in some uncharted territory. And just because we get a study last week doesn't mean they were able to integrate it in the rate decision in January. Right. And this is there are a lot of pieces coming together, whether it's work from home, whether it's getting the retirement done. Right? There are just a lot going on. And I have a lot of concern that when they're doing the forecasting, those models mm -hmm. are based on past relationships. And they're not able to integrate what community members are telling them. I mean, I saw this. That's really hard to bring in in real time. It's really hard to bring research in. The bar is high to use these things in policymaking. Claudia, but well, we have to leave it there. We're out of time, Claudia. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Sam, thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, her work with the Fed, uh, Claudia Sam, Sam Consulting uh, this morning. What do you want to talk about? There's like It's like yesterday. There's like 14 things to talk about. Instead of me thinking something up, Grandma, what do you want to talk about? I just think that the fact that people are taking <clears throat> such a signal from the ADP report, the fact that people are really buying into this idea that there is a softening in the economy that is starting to gain speed is a shift in tone and it's somewhat market and it's happening not only in bonds but right. also stocks. And I go to the technical analysis of that within equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, buttressed up going up against resistance, going down against support. This is the first breakdown this morning, the two-year yield. I mean, John was busting my chops that I said plunge, but I'm sorry, 4.1 over the last number of days. Where was he? He was at the at the Australian Grand Prix. Um, you know, he missed 4.1 percent down to 3.76 percent. I'm sorry, that's a plunge. Well, and this comes <clears throat> as Cleveland Fed President Loretta Messer just said when they talk to banks, they're tightening lender standards but not that much, and that things still look pretty good from their constituent Fed members. They hear positive reports. Squaring that with the dire take on the economy to come yeah. is tough, and this has really been the tension, but it seems to be coalescing around yeah. a greater softening. On radio, when you get, if you're out there driving, keep both hands on the wheel right now looking at the two-year yield, but to see it here on television is a really remarkable shift, of course, into what we'll see from claims tomorrow and then into the jobs report. I'm on my way to Washington, and I will start with Kristalina Gorgieva on what you've been talking about more than anyone I know, China. And I think this is a huge unspoken deal. There is a fantastic piece by Mark Gurman of Bloomberg in Business Week about Apple and how even as they try to woo China, they're quietly trying to shift production away yeah. from China in order to insulate themselves from these growing tensions. Some of the dynamics. We're going to move forward here in a very eventful day off that ADP report. Tomorrow, my conversation with the managing director of the International Monetary Fund on America, China, and the IMF.